Hello my dear lovely students I hope you all are doing fine so once again I welcome you on this amazing platform of physics wala where I Ayushi Agarwal your botany teacher is going to start with the third chapter of class 11th that is plant kingdom this is very important chapter from the point of view of neat and i hope that you all must have seen the first and second video of the chapter living world and biological classification if yes then let's start with the third chapter without wasting the time so let's jump into the third chapter which is plant kingdom first i am going to start with the introduction part of plant kingdom introduction means here you should know the basic outline of plant kingdom in biological classification i have already told you my dear students that the first formal classification system was proposed by linnaeus linnaeus divided organisms into two broad kingdoms as kingdom plantae and kingdom animalia correct so first i am going to share the entire outline of plant kingdom and then one by one we are going to deal in with each group of plant kingdom in detail so first our duty is to understand the outline the chart of plant kingdom are you all ready very good so let's start first with the outline of plant kingdom plant kingdom initially can be broadly divided into two groups as cryptogams and phanerogams cryptogams my dear students include those group of plant kingdom who do not produce seeds that means cryptogams are non spermatophytes non seed bearers on the other hand if i talk about phanerogams then phanerogams are those group of plant kingdom which start producing seeds that means there are spermatophytes or seed bearers clear further cryptogams can be divided into three broad categories as thallophytes followed by bryophyta followed by pteridophyta phanerogams also similarly can be divided into two groups that is gymnosperms which are non flowering seed bearers and the most advanced group of plant kingdom angiosperms clear further thallophytes beta include the most primitive type of plant kingdom group algae their body is thallus like undifferentiated that is why they are kept in the group thallophyta bryophyta can further be divided into three classifications the most primitive one being hepaticopsida followed by anthoceropsida and the most advanced bryophyta are mosses also called as bryopsida clear this is just the outline we will deal in with each group of plant kingdom in detail as we move ahead in the chapter coming to pteridophytes pteridophytes also beta can be divided into four sub groups the most primitive being psilopsida followed by lycopsida then sphenopsida and the most advanced pteridophyte group are pteridopsida 
so this is the outline general outline of cryptogams coming to phanerogams if i talk about phanerogams first is gymnosperms gymnosperms my dear students can further be divided into four groups the most primitive gymnosperms are gynkogales one of the living fossil of gynkogale is gynko biloba followed by cycadales in which comes your cycas coniferales that includes pinus and the most advanced gymnosperms are neetales in which comes neetum velvicia and ephedra correct now talking about angiosperms angiosperms also can be divided into two as dicots and monocots so this is the general outline of the kingdom planty one by one my dear students we are going to cover each group starting with algae bryophytes teredo gymno angio all we are going to cover one by one according to the series of evolution now before starting with the algae part there is some more introduction of the chapter plant kingdom in terms of classification systems so here also we are going to discuss about classification system the most primitive classification system so yes i was telling you about the different types of classification systems the most primitive classification system was proposed by aristotle and linnaeus these two people my dear students are of that era when there were no specialized microscopes no well equipments in order so that they can study the organisms internally hence whatever their classification system was it is strictly based on external morphological features and their classification system is known as artificial classification system so the first classification system which is the most primitive one is artificial classification system proposed by scientists like aristotle and linnaeus their classification system is strictly based on external morphological features since the classification system is only based on morphological features thus the closely related organisms were separated out and the organisms which are not very closely related which are distinctly related were kept together as classification system is merely based upon morphology correct so this is one of the demerit of this classification system that it is simply based on external morphological features like shape of the leaf structure of the root stem etc habit habitat distribution number of stamens so this classification system is only based on morphological features so it it had so many drawbacks the major drawback was separated closely related species and kept together distinctly related ones clear so this was being a demerit it was soon discarded and this artificial classification system was then replaced by natural classification system natural classification system was proposed by scientists like bentham and hooker these two people beta they used not only external features but they also considered internal features like cytology phytochemistry embryology anatomy embryology anatomy etc so the classification system which is proposed by bentham and hooker considered both internal as well as external features of classification thus it was better than artificial but is it of complete use no why it also had its own demerits this bentham and hooker classification system 
also has its own demerit as it did not consider phylogeny it did not consider evolutionary history because of which bentham and hooker believed that species are static they do not evolve because these scientists did not knew the concept of phylogeny they did not knew the concept of evolutionary history they believed that species are static so this was their major drawback that they believed species are static they do not evolve and why do they consider the species are static because they did not know the concept of phylogeny so this classification system also got replaced by another classification systems proposed by different scientists of modern era and their classification system is known as phylogenetic classification system in phylogenetic classification system my dear students scientists like takta jan hutchinson engler and prantel ostwald and tipo these names of scientist are the scientist of modern era who propose their own classification systems based upon based upon what based upon phylogeny along with internal as well as external features clear so the three classification systems are artificial based only on external morphological features like shape of the leaf structure of the leaf arrangement of flower fruit etc then second came natural classification system it was based not only on external but also on internal features like cytological embryological anatomical etc and so on however this natural classification system was also incomplete as it did not consider phylogeny hence later on modern time when modern era came when modern era scientist came they got to know the concept of phylogeny therefore natural classification system was then replaced by phylogenetic classification system where classification was done not only on the basis of external features internal features but phylogeny was also considered these modern era scientists believed that if any two organisms who are kept in the same taxa then they have a common ancestor for example primata you know primata is a order it is one of the category of classification and in primata humans monkeys apes we all are kept together so why are we kept together in that order primata because we all have a common ancestor so this concept came once the scientist came to know about phylogeny so the most important and successful reason of phylogenetic classification system is that the scientist were able to trace evolution right so their basis was they considered phylogeny as well for the classification along with internal and external features as a result they believed they assumed that organisms belonging to same taxa have a common ancestor yes or no so these are the different classification systems apart from different classification systems we have different types of taxonomies also that help in classification here you are going to study about three different types of taxonomy cytotaxonomy chemotaxonomy and numerical taxonomy starting with cyto cytotaxonomy means when classification of an organism is done by studying the features like structure of chromosome arrangement of chromosome type and features of chromosome 
so what is cytotaxonomy taxonomy that is based on cytological informations like chromosome number their structure their arrangement and their behavior remember this thing clear next is chemotaxonomy chemo means chemical so when classification is done on the basis of this chemicals present in a body chemicals may be proteins dna rna and all those chemicals crystals of calcium carbonate crystals of calcium oxalate etc there's so many chemicals present in a body and when chemicals are made the basis of classification then that classification then that taxonomy is chemotaxonomy so let's read chemotaxonomy means when the chemical constituents are used to solve the issues to solve to solve the confusion of classification then that type of taxonomy is chemo third is numerical taxonomy also known as phenetics the other term for numerical taxonomy is phenetics this type of taxonomy plays with numbers and codes first of all in numerical taxonomy only morphological only observable characters are used in order to classify two organisms suppose i am having two organisms and i, and I want to classify them so i am go only going to use the external morphological features in phenetics this is one of their drawback you can say that it is only based on observable morphological features number one point second in numerical taxonomy we are using computers we are it is also called as taxi matrix because we are using computers for classification each characters are assigned with codes or numbers like plus minus or zero at the same time we can consider number of characters in order to identify two organisms clear see numerical taxonomy it is now easily carried out using computers there are certain softwares designed which are installed in the computers and scientists use those softwares in order to classify the organisms by considering only observable morphological features since we are using computers since we are using softwares so at a time same time hundreds of characters can be considered and each characters are assigned with codes or numbers read it i hope first point is clear second point numbers and codes are assigned to all the characters like plus minus or zero and then the data is processed in the computer you are going to feed the information for any character like plus if it is present in that organism if absent then minus so you giving the data once the entire data is fed into the computer computer is going to process that information and is going to give you the result that which organism belongs to which category clear then in this way each character is given equal importance obviously at the same time you are considering so many characters so each character will be given equal weightage there will be no injustice done to any character and at the same time hundreds of characters can be considered clear and one more point it is based only on observable characters i hope all the points of numerical taxonomy are clear it should be on your tips any question can be asked on any lines which i have mentioned on my screen i hope classification systems and types of taxonomy along with the outline of plant kingdom is clear to all my students if yes then i will proceed further with the first group of plant kingdom that is thallophyta or algae right okay so now without further wasting time let's start with algae so what are algaes algaes are the most 
प्रिमिटिव ग्रुप ऑफ प्लांट किंगडम दे आर मेजरली एक्वेटिक राइट दे आर एक्वेटिक ऑर्गेनिजम हुज बॉडी इज थैलस लाइक अनडिफ्रेंशिएटेड दे आर क्लोरोफिलस ऑर्गेनिजम दैट मीन्स दे कैन प्रिपेयर देयर ओन फूड सो फर्स्ट जनरल फीचर विद रिस्पेक्ट टू एलगी इज देर क्लोरोफिलस बेयरिंग क्लोरोफिल बेयरिंग है दैट इज वाई दे आर पार्ट ऑफ प्लांट किंगडम ना सो देर क्लोरोफिल इज क्लोरोफिल बेयरिंग दैट मीन्स दे कैन परफॉर्म फोटो सिंथिस सिंपल थैलॉइड थैलॉइड मीन्स बॉडी इज थैलस लाइक और undifferentiated undifferentiated means that the body is made up of group of haploid cells undifferentiated means lacks true root stems and leaves why they lack true root stems and leaf the reason is what is the reason the reason is presence of haploid cells and such body is called as thallus like body autotrophic very clear they are largely aquatic they are majorly they are found in water that may be fresh water or marine clear so i hope the first point and the foremost point for algae is clear in each and every student's mind very good come into the second point now where they are aquatic understood now something more than that so algae are aquatic organisms their body size ranges from being unicellular to multicellular from colonial to independent from simple to filamentous like so there's a high range of algae in terms of their body sizes and organization so some are unicellular algae some are multicellular some are having filamentous body some are colonial some are sit individual independently living correct some lives independently and some algae form symbiotic association like you see in case of lichens biological classification lichens lichen is a mutual association of fungi and a green algae correct so they occur in variety of other habitats moist stone soil and wood apart from being aquatic they can also be found like in moist soil or wood and they also live in association they also form some symbiotic association with other organisms like for example lichen lichen you all know another example which i have written on my screen is of sloth bear now my dear students sloth bear is a very lazy kind of an animal right it's a white furry bear sloth bear is a white furry bear which is lazy now it's so lazy that even if predator comes in front of him then this fellow will feel like it's okay let the predator come let me eat it's okay so this fellow the sloth bear is not going to run and even if it is going to run it's not going to run in a such a speed so that it can be protected from the predator in that case god knew that baba the sloth bear is a very lazy animal so god themselves games gave some help to sloth bear in order to protect it from the predator how on the surface now the skin of sloth bear is hygroscopic and on this body the green algae called trichophilus grows and it camouflages the entire sloth bear it now from far if a predator will observe sloth bear with trichophilus then predator will think that it is a green mat and it is not going to come near to this organism thus this organism will be protected from the predation clear in return trichophilus is getting the shelter to grow so this trichophilus is a green algae which grows on the back of sloth bear camouflaging it thus protecting it from the predator 
and itself getting the shelter hence this is a symbiotic or mutualistic association between these two organisms clear come on let's write it so another is sloth bear now this is kind of an epizoic association zoe means the organism is growing on the animal a zoe epi means on the surface so this association of trichophilus and sloth bear is an epizoic association now let me write it over here so what is trichophilus it is basically a green algae that grows on the back of sloth bear why camouflaging it yes camouflaging it from its predator in return it gets the shelter so this is the symbiotic association which is seen between trichophilus and sloth bear so algae is they are majorly aquatic some may be found on terrestrial region some also form symbiotic association like for example lichens and sloth bear moving ahead let's talk about their sizes now the forms and sizes of algae is also highly variable some may be unicellular ranging from colonial forms like volvox one of the example of green alga which is which lives which prefers to live in colony is volvox and filamentous means the the organism which is multicellular number of cells they join together to form a thin thread like structure so that thin thread like structure is called filamentous body and green algae is like eulothrix and spirogyra they exhibit filamentous body filamentous body means somewhat like this so number of cells they join together to form a thin thread like body a filamentous body so this body is seen in some of the green algae like eulothrix and spirogyra they may be unicellular as well as they may be multicellular now there are some green so there are some algae mainly brown algae like kelps and macrocystis whose who, whose size may range up to in feet so there are few macroscopic algae as well and there are few microscopic algae as well so few of the marine forms such as kelps form massive plant like bodies undifferentiated not true body but yes they may possess plant like bodies root like stem like and leaf like structures clear yes now moving ahead now let's talk about the methods of reproduction exhibited by algae so algae can show all the three methods of reproduction including vegetative through fragmentation asexual by sporulation method and sexual reproduction also by producing gamete and their fusion so now we are going to talk about the modes of reproduction in algae let's proceed if i talk about vegetative reproduction it is done simply by fragmentation coming to mode of asexual reproduction so algae is living in water can reproduce asexually by producing spores which type of spores motile thin walled spores called zoospores so algae reproduces asexually by producing motile thin walled zoospores right so asexual reproduction is observed in algae with the help of spores which spores motile spores zoospores clear 
moving ahead to the sexual reproduction now algae can show sexual reproduction they will involve gamete formation and fusion by three different methods isogamous and isogamous and oogamous so first i will tell you about what is isogamous iso means same gamous gamous means fusion of gametes so in those algae whose both male and female gamete are morphologically and physiologically same and if such gametes fuses to form the zygote then that type of fertilization is known as isogamous fertilization what is isogamous let's see let's write when both the gametes that is male and female are morphologically as well as physiologically similar like for example chlamydomonas eulothrix spirogyra these are some of the examples of algae which shows isogamous type of sexual reproduction why because they all produce same type of male and female gamete both male and female gamete will be same in shape suppose this is male gamete and this is female gamete so both will be same in shape and size plus they both may be motile or they both may be non motile like for example in chlamydomonas and eulothrix both the male and female gamete are motile they are having flagella however in case of spirogyra the both the gametes are morphologically similar but they lack flagella they produce non motile gametes so either non motile gametes honge whereas in these two case the gametes will be morphologically similar no doubt but they both will be motile clear so if when such type of gametes they fuse to form zygote then this type of fertilization is known as isogamous type of fertilization clear or not what is the difference between chlamydomonas eulothrix and spirogyra spirogyra produces morphologically similar gametes but both of them are non motile in case of chlamydomonas and eulothrix morphologically similar but both the gametes are motile tick overall isogamous apart from isogamous another type of sexual reproduction is n isogamous n isogamous reproduction means n means opposite opposite to isogamous so in n iso an isogamous you saw that when morphologically and physiologically similar gametes fuses here in case of n isogamous when morphologically dissimilar gametes fuses to form zygote like for example when the female gamete is large and motile whereas male gamete is small and motile when such morphologically dissimilar gametes fuses then this type of fertilization is known as n isogamous and it is observed in some species of chlamydomonas chlamydomonas is a genera which includes number of species and some species of chlamydomonas exhibit isogamous some exhibits n isogamous and some also exhibits oogamous so chlamydomonas example you can mention in all the three types of fertilization iso n iso as well as o right so what is n isogamous 
when morphologically dissimilar gametes fuses to form zygote example i've told you clamidomonas what happens here now what happens in an isogamous female gamete is larger in size whereas male gamete is smaller in size so when such dissimilar gametes they fuses to form zygote then it is known as an isogamous type third is oogamous type of sexual reproduction exhibited by clamidomonas some species of clamidomonas as well as green colonial algae volvox what happens in oogamous type of sexual reproduction female gamete is large and non motile so when female gamete is large and non motile whereas male gamete is small and motile when such type of gametes fuses so this is the female gamete this is the male gamete so when such type of gametes they fuse to form zygote then this type of fertilization is known as oogamous type and it is observed in case of some species of clamidomonas and green colonial algae volvox i hope all the three methods of sexual reproduction is also clear in everybody's mind so these are the certain general features of algae which you have to remember first of all they are aquatic their body is thallus like they are chlorophyll bearing they are autotrophic their size and form may vary from being unicellular to multicellular from being filamentous to colonial etc some algae may live on land some may be terrestrial may be found on wood may be found in soil some may form symbiotic association like in lichens in sloth bear i hope all these points are clear algae can reproduce asexually sexually and vegetatively now one more important point which now i'm going to tell you is about the life cycle of algae if i talk about the life cycle of algae then the life cycle of algae is haplontic type now what is haplontic type of life cycle let's discuss that life cycle of algae now i told you it is haplontic but ma'am what is haplontic so before starting before explaining haplontic type of life cycle pattern let me tell you one thing beta those organisms who shows sexual reproduction that means they show alternation of generation i have told this in biological classification sexual reproduction means alternation of generation alternation of generation means switch between haploid phase and diploid phase in the life cycle we humans also are sexually active we also show sexual reproduction that means alternation of generation is present in our self as well how the current body of mine this whole body is made up of group of diploid cells right a body which is represented by group of diploid cell is known as sporophytic body now in some cells of my body that is gonad cells meiosis will take place to produce gamete gametes are haploid that means sporophytic body has switched to gametophytic body gametophytic body is represented by group of haploid cells now those gametes are produced they will again fuse to form zygote zygote means diploid cell again from haploid you have switched to diploid now that zygote will produce a full fledged multicell diploid body 
sporophytic body again meiosis will take place again gametophyte again fusion sporophyte meiosis gametophyte fusion sporophyte so this circle keeps on going and this circle is known as alternation of generation which is observed in sexually active organisms algae show sexual reproduction therefore they show switch between gametophyte and sporophyte so first i'll write this so algae's life cycle is haplontic before starting with haplontic let me tell you life cycle of any organism of any sexually active organism alternates between haploid phase and diploid phase the diploid phase in the life cycle is known as sporophytic phase whereas the haploid phase in the life cycle is known as gametophytic phase to go from haploid to diploid fusion is required and to move from diploid to haploid from sporophyte to gametophyte meiosis is required fusion means fertilization and meiosis is required clear now this much you have understood now beta in evolution series according to evolution series the most primitive group of organisms are algae and most advanced are angiosperms correct that means the sequence of evolution would have been algae gave rise to from algae came bryo from bryo came teredo from teredo came gymno and then the most advanced group came that is angio so it was told by a scientist there was one scientist called chamberlain he explained that as we go up in the evolution series the dominance of gametophytic phase in the life cycle of an organism decreases and dominance of sporophytic sporophytic phase increases what is this check see how many groups of organisms are there in plant kingdom algae bryophytes pteridophytes gymnosperms and angiosperms correct most primitive algae most advanced angio what chamberlain said chamberlain said that as you go up in the evolution series the dominance of sporophyte here is sporophyte this x axis means sporophyte and this y axis is gametophyte so can you observe one thing students that as you are moving up in the series algae is having its major life cycle in haploid stage can you see can you see this small dabba in algae is beta the sporophytic phase in their life cycle is very very short lived their major life cycle is remaining in haploid phase but as we are moving up can you check now angiosperms the most advanced group of plant kingdom in may haploid phase that is gametophytic phase has become so reduced and the sporophytic phase has become dominant has become dominant yes or no clear so this is this chart is going to help you to remember all the life cycle patterns in different group of plant kingdom now in algae beta haploid phase is highly dominant and diploid phase is highly reduced can we say this in algae haploid phase is highly dominant 
and diploid phase is highly reduced can you check this with the help of the diagram right okay now this means what haploid if it is highly dominant and diploid is highly reduced this means that in algae zygote soon after the formation of zygote zygote undergoes meiosis zygote undergoes meiosis to release haploid spores if i talk about the life cycle of algae then how will i draw see i will have haploid spores tick these haploid spores will germinate to produce two different male and female algae i'm considering them as unisexual right so they will they will produce first a male thallus and there will be a female thallus right thallus means haploid body spores are haploid the thallus is de de developing with the help of mitosis now from the male thallus will come the male gamete it will release male gamete by mitosis gametes are always pure they are always haploid since the body is itself haploid so by the process of mitosis male gametes will be produced similarly female thallus is also haploid by the process of mitosis it is going to produce the female gamete now male and female gametes are released a time will come when both of them are going to fuse to form a diploid zygote and this zygote instead of undergoing mitosis it soon undergoes meiosis to release haploid spores again so here in overall in the entire life cycle what you observe that there is only one cell only one cell to represent diploid phase to represent sporophytic phase so this is sporophytic phase which is represented by only one cell and remaining life cycle of entire algae is in haploid phase correct so haploid phase in the life cycle of algae is highly dominant and diploid phase is highly reduced reduced means that it is represented only by single cell called zygote am i clear or not i will repeat it once again please pay attention life cycle of algae is haplontic haplontic life cycle is also known as zygotic meiosis because zygote immediately undergoes meiosis as soon as it is produced clear haplontic life cycle is characterized by presence of gametophytic phase which is highly dominant and it alternates with highly reduced sporophyte which is represented only by single zygote clear now for this i have used a chart in order to explain you that in the evolution series as you go up the dominance of gametophyte decreases and the dominance of sporophyte increases so when it comes to algae algae being the most primitive group their life cycle pattern is haplontic why because their gametophyte phase is highly dominant and their sporophyte phase is highly reduced which is only represented by zygote and this is how you draw the life cycle of algae spores which are produced by the meiosis in zygote zygote undergoes reduction division to release haploid meiospores these haploid meiospores when they get the favorable condition they develop into male and female thallus correct male thallus female thallus they are what they are the algae body algae is a thallus like organisms male thallus by the process of mitosis will produce male gamete female thallus by the process of mitosis will produce female gamete both the gametes will be discharged 
a time will come when they will undergo fusion to reform the zygote that means in the whole cycle the only one diploid cell is produced zygote rest you can see everything is haploid meiospores haploid body haploid gamete haploid only one diploid cell is produced which is zygote so you can see sporophyte is so small and gametophyte is entire this life cycle pattern is known as what this life cycle pattern is known as haplontic or zygotic meiosis am i clear now so these are the different general features related to algae now we are going to head towards the classification scheme of algae so now starting with the first group of plant kingdom the thallophytes which includes algae now we are going to start students with algae in algae beta first of all these are the simplest most group of plant kingdom which are majorly aquatic may live in fresh water may live in marine water correct so first point which you have to remember in algae is that majority of the algaes are aquatic second they are the body organization if i talk about algae then their body organization is simple thallus like thallus like the body which is undifferentiated does not possess true root stems and leaves because the body is made up of group of haploid cells instead of diploid cells so the body of algae is thallus like thalloid body so if i say that the algae body is thallus like this means what this means that the body of algae is undifferentiated that means it lacks true root stems and leaves the body is made up of group of haploid cells so in front of undifferentiated we can also write that the body which is made up of group of haploid cells clear now since they are the member of plant kingdom therefore they are chlorophyllous they can prepare their own food so first point says that algae are chlorophyllous bearing structures their body organization is simple they are thallus like do not possess true root stems and leaves majorly they are aquatic maybe fresh water or marine now these algaes if they are found on land they may be found on moist soil wood etc some algaes beta also form symbiotic association like for example lichens we have already studied about lichens in the chapter biological classification lichens are the mutualistic association between fungi and algae yes so sometimes algae are often seen making symbiotic association with some other organism apart from lichens there is one more example of algae showing symbiotic association which is sloth bear now sloth bear my dear student is a lazy kind of an animal the animal who does not want to even move in the presence of predators now god knew that sloth bear is a lazy animal so how to protect such an animal who is lazy will move slow even in front of the predator so god in order to help sloth bear sent green algae trichophyllous so sloth bear get mutually associated with a green algae called trichophyllous this is a chlorophyce member it is a green algae now what this green algae does these green algae is my dear students they start growing on the body on the surface of sloth bear thus turning the white skin of sloth bear into green mat like 
in short you can say that trichophilus camouflages the sloth bear now a animal now the predator who is seeing the sloth bear far away will not be able to identify what that predator will view that there is some green mat will not be able to analyze that whether it is a prey or not whether there is sloth bear or not so simply trichophilus grows on the body of sloth bear thus camouflaging in in return trichophilus gets the shelter it gets the space to live in hence this association where trichophilus is helping sloth bear and sloth bear is helping trichophilus is a mutualistic association clear so trichophilus is helping sloth bear by camouflaging it whereas sloth bear is helping trichophilus by providing its space for living shelter i hope this point is also clear moving ahead with the third important feature of algae where we are talking about the variations of algae in terms of size algae is beta some algae are unicellular some may be multicellular some may be colonial some may form filamentous like body some brown algae are huge macroscopic in size like for example kelps and macrocystis so on the basis of size algae show great range of variation algae like chlamydomonas is unicellular some algae like spirogyra and eulothrix they are filamentous filamentous means number of cells they join together to form a thin thread like structure such filamentous body is also exhibited by some green algae like eulothrix and spirogyra apart from this there is one more green algae called volvox it is a colonial algae as number of cells they live together in a colony like manner clear so next point the forms and size of algae is highly variable ranging from colonial forms like volvox and filamentous forms like eulothrix or spirogyra a few of the algae which are marine which are found in water and which type of water marine water they may be huge in sizes the body may be differentiated into root like stem like or leaf like structures and such examples of algae whose body is large enough are like kelps and macrocystis so they form massive plant like bodies clear very good now moving ahead towards the next important general feature of algae is their reproduction the mode of reproduction algae my dear students can reproduce by all the three methods vegetative asexual and sexual if i talk about their vegetative reproduction my dear students then algae reproduces vegetatively by fragmentation method that means a part of algae may get detached from the main body and if gets the favorable condition can start developing into a new organism clear apart from showing vegetative mode of reproduction algae can also reproduce asexually by sporulation method and sexually by forming gamete and letting their fusion so i hope vegetative reproduction is clear moving ahead towards their asexual mode of reproduction if i talk about their asexual mode of reproduction then algae reproduces by sporulation method as you have seen in case of fungi when the conditions are favorable then algae they produce thin walled motile endogenous spores called zoospores these spores are produced 
and then they are released outside so that whenever they get further favorable condition they can develop into new organisms so what i have said algae can reproduce asexually by producing spores like zoo spores shall we write it so during favorable conditions during favorable conditions they may produce spores like zoo spore and what are the features of these zoo spores the zoo spores are planospore means motile spore thin walled and endogenous spores right now moving towards the sexual reproduction which is very very important and yes algae do reproduce sexually by forming gametes and letting their fusion to form zygote now gametes are produced and now how gametes structurally they are how the fusion is taking place on that basis on the morphology and physiology of gametes produced by the algae there can be three types of sexual reproduction isogamous n isogamous and oogamous so first we are going to discuss n isogamous mode of reproduction sorry isogamous correct now iso my dear students means same correct and gamus means fusion of gametes yes or no so isogamous type of sexual reproduction is performed by those algae whose both male and female gametes are morphologically as well as physiologically similar that means the size of male and female gametes are same and physiology means either presence or absence of flagella so if gametes are motile then both should be motile if gametes are non motile then both should be non motile if such type of gametes they fuse to form zygote then this type of fertilization or this type of reproduction is known as isogamous reproduction clear so what is isogamous isogamous reproduction means when both morphologically as well as physiologically similar gametes fuses to form zygote now see both suppose this is my male gamete and this is my female gamete so can you see that both the gametes are same in size now whether they sh both should be motile or both should be non motile so that means they are physiologically also same to produce the diploid zygote clear or not okay now in isogamous type of sexual reproduction examples are like chlamydomonas eulothrix spirogyra when i talk about chlamydomonas and eulothrix chlamydomonas and eulothrix my dear students then these two produce morphologically similar 
and motile gametes whereas if i talk about spirogyra then my dear students spirogyra also shows isogamous type of sexual reproduction where both male and female gametes are morphologically same physiologically also same as both the gametes are non motile so spirogyra produces non motile gametes whereas eulothrix and chlamydomonas produces motile gametes for fertilization will you remember this thing yes very good so this is one of the type of sexual reproduction now moving ahead towards second type called as an isogamous an means opposite opposite to what opposite to isogamous sexual reproduction opposite means in isogamous you have observed that similar gametes were fusing so in an isogamous this similar gametes will fuse when both male and female gametes are morphologically dissimilar when such gametes fuses to form zygote then this type of sexual reproduction is known as an isogamous clear let's write it an isogamous means when morphologically dissimilar gametes fuses when morphologically dissimilar gametes they fuse to form zygote that is when male gamete is small in size and motile whereas female gamete is large in size and motile when such gametes they fuses to form diploid zygote then it is known as an isogamous sexual reproduction for example some species of chlamydomonas remember students chlamydomonas is a genera who has different species some species can show isogamy some can show an isogamy as well as some can show oogamy as well so chlamydomonas example you can quote in all the three types of sexual reproduction will you remember this thing very good so here we can quote example of chlamydomonas clear moving ahead to oogamous oogamous type of sexual reproduction means when the male gamete is small and non motile whereas female gamete is large Uh, uh, when male gamete is small and motile whereas female gamete is large and non motile when such two gametes they fuse to form zygote then this type of fertilization is known as oogamous clear shall we write it come on so what is oogamous oogamous means when male gamete is small and motile whereas female gamete is large and non motile so when such type of gametes they fertilize So suppose this is my male gamete and this is my female gamete so when such gametes they fuse to form zygote then this type of fertilization my dear students is known as oogamous for example volvox volvox a colonial green algae fucus as well as you can quote the example of chlamydomonas clear so here you can write the examples examples are very important my dear students you should remember them 
example based questions are favorite from the point of view of neat right so please pay attention to all the examples as well i hope all the three methods of sexual reproduction is clear to everyone so this is all about the reproduction part in algae moving ahead now let's discuss the life cycle pattern of algae life cycle pattern if i talk about then my dear students algae is they show haplontic life cycle pattern now and what is haplontic life cycle pattern so before i explain you haplontic life cycle pattern i want to just share some extra information dear students when an organism is performing true sexual reproduction that means it is forming gametes which are haploid then these haploid gametes they fuse to form zygote which is again diploid so we can say that organisms who shows true sexual reproduction are actually showing alternation of generation from haploid to diploid and diploid to haploid the haploid phase in the life cycle of an individual is known as its gametophytic phase whereas the diploid phase is known as sporophytic phase clear write it haplontic life cycle pattern we will do later i'll come to this topic but first understand the concept of alternation of generation so organisms which are showing true sexual reproduction involves true sexual reproduction means what means showing true alternation of generation first thing clear now what do you mean by alternation of generation alternation of generation my dear students means switch between haploid and diploid phase haploid means gametes gametes are produced by meiosis and they again fertilize to go to diploid phase then diploid zygote is produced that undergoes repeated mitosis to produce sporophytic phase correct and again in sporophytic cells meiosis takes place to regenerate or to reproduce the gametes so diploid cell coming back to haploid stage is by meiosis clear yes or no the haploid phase is known as gametophytic phase is known as gametophytic phase whereas diploid stage in the life cycle is known as sporophytic phase clear like for example in us if i talk about my own body then my whole body is made up of group of diploid cells so right now my body is in sporophytic phase but if i specifically talk about my gonads my ovaries then my ovaries a time will come when they will undergo meiosis to produce eggs which are gamete that means from sporophytic phase we have switched to gametophytic phase in the form of gametes now gametes will fertilize a time will come when gametes will fertilize to again form the zygote and zygote is a diploid cell so again from gametophytic phase we have switched back to sporophytic phase now this zygote will undergo mitosis to form a full fledged human body again again in that human body gonads will be there meiosis will take place again gametes so this switch from haploid to diploid and diploid to haploid keeps on taking place when sexual reproduction is occurring and this is known as alternation of generation clear very good so now that means there are two phases in any one's life cycle who is showing sexual reproduction gametophytic phase 
एंड स्पोरोफाइटिक फेज क्लियर वेरी गुड नाउ बच्चो इफ आई स्पेसिफिकली टॉक अबाउट प्लांट किंगडम सो सीरीज ऑफ प्लांट किंगडम एज आई टोल्ड यू इज प्रिमिटिव वंस एलगी फ्रॉम एलगी ओरिजिनेटेड ब्रायोफाइट देन टेरिडोफाइट देन जिम्नोस्पर्म्स एंड देन केम योर एनजियोस्पर्म्स करेक्ट सो सीक्वेंस ऑफ एवोल्यूशन कैन बी से लाइक दिस कैन बी राइटेड इन दिस मैनर दैट इज एलगी ब्रायोफाइट्स टेरिडोफाइट्स जिम्नोस्पर्म्स एंड एनजियोस्पर्म्स करेक्ट now my dear student there was a scientist called chamberlain he said that in the most primitive group of organisms which is algae the dominant phase is gametophyte which alternates with highly reduced sporophyte how see according to him according to chamberlain as we go high in the series from algae to angiosperms the dominance of sporophyte increases and the dominance of gametophyte decreases can you check in this box let me help you see so this whole box this box this blue which i am doing this is showing the life cycle of algae now can you see in this box that major phase of the life cycle of algae is in gametophytic stage this is all gametophyte right and this small portion this small portion in the life cycle of algae is actually sporophyte right now as you are going upward in the series when you come to angiosperms can you see my dear students that dominance of gametophyte has reduced to such an extent as it was in case of algae for sporophyte and for sporophyte angiosperm has become dominant see this this is all sporophyte so this means as we go up in the series life cycle will always have two phase sporophyte and gametophyte always alternation of generation will take place however one phase will be dominant to other which in case of algae is that gametophyte is dominant why because algae is the most primitive group of plant kingdom and it is known that in primitive groups gametophytic phase is dominant and as you go high in the evolution series the dominance of gametophyte decreases right clear to everybody and when gametophytic phase is highly dominant over sporophyte then that life cycle pattern is known as haplontic haplontic life cycle pattern is that life cycle pattern where gametophyte phase is highly dominant over sporophyte phase correct yes or no now let me show you the life cycle of algae see now diagrammatically we shall do it okay so here i am going to show you the life cycle of algae let's start the life cycle of algae with simply meiospores the haploid cells which further forms the body so that are called as meiospores these are suppose the haploid meiospores correct now these meiospores whenever they are going to get the favorable condition they will develop into the main body now the main body of algae is also haploid you know thallus like undifferentiated made up of haploid cells so when these haploid meiospores will germinate when they will get the favorable conditions these meiospores 
will develop into main body of algae which is thallus like haploid cell body by the process of mitosis correct now there will be a male thallus algae and there will be a female thallus if that algae is unisexual suppose i am drawing a unisexual life cycle so one there will be a body one there will be a thallus like body of male and another will be of female body so one will be a male algae another will be a female algae for example now the male thallus is also haploid female thallus is also haploid thallus itself means haploid from haploid body if haploid gametes have to be produced then what is the method mitosis or meiosis of course mitosis why because gametes are always haploid and bodies also haploid so haploid to haploid means mitosis so male body via mitosis will produce male gamete right it is going to produce what male gamete similarly the female thallus via mitosis will produce female gametes so now these gametes are also what my dear students they are also haploid now when they will get the favorable conditions terms then these male and female gametes are going to fertilize what will they produce the first diploid cell that is zygote clear abhi tak sara haploid tha meiospores haploid body haploid gametes haploid now the first cell is produced in the life cycle of algae which is diploid and that to zygote now this zygote as soon as it is produced it will immediately undergo reduction division to yield the haploid cells once again and thus completing the life cycle now see in this life cycle my dear students now just check the percentage of haploid and diploid stages if we talk about haploid stages then spores haploid main body haploid gametes haploid so this much this whole can you see this this structure this whole phase of the life cycle is haploid in terms of diploid only one zygote is produced so can we say that in the whole life cycle of algae the dominance of sporophyte is not is so reduced na only represented by single zygote remaining 95% of the life cycle is completed in haploid stage so have i written this correctly that gametophyte is highly highly dominant over sporophyte can we write one more point that sporophyte is only represented by one cell that is zygote can we write this information as well yes of course the result is in front of you so this life cycle pattern where sporophyte is highly reduced and gametophyte is highly dominant the sporophyte is only represented by single cell that is zygote which when the time comes immediately undergoes meiosis that is why this life cycle pattern can also be known as zygotic meiosis so this life cycle pattern my dear students is also known as zygotic meiosis why because as soon as the zygote is produced it immediately undergoes meiosis clear so if question comes what is the general life cycle pattern of algae it is haplontic can we call haplontic life cycle pattern as zygotic meiosis yes why because the zygote as soon as it is formed it undergoes reductional division 
clear to everybody so this is how the life cycle pattern in general of algae is exceptions are there but about exceptions i will talk in the last here we are just talking about the general features so here are the general features of algae hope the all general features are clear now moving ahead next topic in algae is its classification so algae is on the basis of certain features like photosynthetic pigment reserve food material number of flagella cell wall composition and habit and habitat on so many features algae can be divided into three broad groups clear out of so many features the most important is first one correct so photosynthetic pigments are the most important features of the classification of algae apart from photosynthetic pigments these all are the features that were also considered in order to classify in order to group algae into three and those three groups those three classifications of algae proposed by frisch so frisch was the scientist who actually gave this classification system and those three groups are chlorophyce commonly called as green algae rhodophyce commonly called as red algae and pheophyce commonly called as brown algae so there are three groups chloro rhodo pheo green red brown right now let's see all the three groups of algae in detail on the basis of features which i have told you shall we started very good so first feature which i am going to consider now is the most important one that is photosynthetic pigments i'll just write as pp pp is photosynthetic pigments you know all the three groups are of algae algae is are autotrophic so definitely whether it is chlorophyce rhodophyce or pheophyce all of them will have photosynthetic pigments but the type of pigments varies on the basis of which they are categorized right so first we are going to talk about chlorophyce which are commonly known as green algae so i'll write on top that they are known as green algae why are they known as green algae what is the reason the reason is the type of pigments found and what are those pigments which are imparting them green color so the photosynthetic pigments found in chlorophyce are chlorophyll a chlorophyll b xanthophylls and carotenoids right because of which they are green in color now talking about pheophyce they are actually brown colored algae i cannot see brown so i'll use this okay so pheophyce are my dear students brown algae why are they brown again the reason is the presence of pigments so pigments found in brown algae pheophyce is chlorophyll a apart from chlorophyll it is chlorophyll c not b chlorophyll c and then some additional xanthophylls and carotenoids now my dear student brown algae they have a special xanthophyll called fucoxanthin and this fucoxanthin this presence of fucoxanthin is actually responsible for imparting brown color to these algae clear 
very good more amount of eucoxanthin intenses the coloration less amount of eucoxanthin less brown coloration right very good moving ahead to the third group which is rhodophyce now rhodophyce are red colored algae why are they red in color same reason presence of pigments and they have chlorophyll a can you see chlorophyll a is common in all of the three yes now apart from chlorophyll a my dear students they have chlorophyll d b c d easy to remember a is common b c d right now apart from chlorophyll a and chlorophyll d they also have phycoerythrin phycoerythrin is a type of phycobilin and this phycoerythrin is responsible for what it is responsible for imparting them red coloration correct so apart from a and d they also have <coughs> phycoerythrin phycoerythrin is a type of phycobilin and this phycoerythrin is red colored it provides red color to the organism so on the basis of pigments i hope everything is clear now second important factor on the basis of which they are grouped is habit and habitat that means where are they found so students when i started with algae i told you one thing that they are majorly aquatic so all the three groups of algae they are majorly aquatic now you have to decide whether fresh water or marine water so if i talk about chlorophyce they are aquatic but majorly they are fresh water right coming to pheophyce brown algae they are also aquatic but majorly or in fact sometimes we can also say with very few exceptions taking aside exclusively brown algae are marine correct moving to rhodophyce rhodophyce also they are aquatic and majorly they are marine in nature few forms are found in fresh water otherwise majority of rhodophyce are also marine algae clear now third feature is the type of food they produce the type of food they produce and in which form do they store so third feature on the basis of which we are going to classify them is reserve food material now chlorophyce green algae you know they will prepare their own food when excess of food will be there then definitely they need to store it somewhere and in what form are they going to store so chlorophyce stores food in the form of starch moving ahead to brown algae brown algae stores food in the form of leucosine oil correct whereas if i talk about rhodophyce then my dear students rhodophyce stores food in the form of floridian starch which is structurally similar to amylopectin and glycogen so they store food in the form of floridian starch which is structurally similar to amylopectin and glycogen clear yes very good now next important feature on the basis of which we are going to group them is cell wall composition 
that which type of cell wall is present what is the composition so chlorophyce which are directly similar to higher plants the cell wall of chlorophyce is made up of pectin and cellulose the outer layers of cell wall are made up of pectin and inner ones are cell cellulosic so you can write that the cell wall is pectocellulosic clear coming to pheophyce brown algae their cell wall is also made up of pectin and cellulose but apart from pectin and cellulose they also have some hydrocolloids some sulfated hydro some non sulfated hydrocolloids hydrocolloids my dear students are those chemicals which have the capacity to hold water they have the capacity to hold water right and the hydrocolloid which is found in the cell wall of brown algae is algin what is algin it is a hydrocolloid it is a water holding substance right shall we write so the cell wall is pectocellulosic along with that along with cellulose and pectin the cell wall also contains non sulfated hydrocolloid called algin yes or no coming to rhodophyces rhodophyces also beta their cell wall has cellulose and pectin but apart from these two they also have water holding substance but their water holding substance their hydrocolloids are sulfated like for example carrageenan and agar agar right so what are we going to write oh ho where it is so what are we going to write after cellulose and pectin the cell wall on also contains sulfated hydrocolloids hydrocolloids sulfated hydrocolloids like for example agar agar carrageenan clear yes or no okay so these are the certain features on the basis of which we have classified moving ahead moving ahead so here we are mentioning chlorophyces then here we are mentioning pheophyces and here we are mentioning rhodophyces the next important feature on the basis of which we are going to classify algae is the type of reproduction reproduction so surely chlorophyces can reproduce asexually as well as sexually if i talk about sexual reproduction then chlorophyce can show isogamy and isogamy or oogamy you have studied all the examples of chlorophyce either showing some isogamy and isogamy or oogamy so you can simply write that chlamydom uh, chlorophyce can reproduce by all the methods of sexual reproduction as well as they reproduce by forming zoospores and oogamous same goes for pheophyces pheophyces can also reproduce both asexually as well as sexually asexually they reproduce by forming zoospores and sexually also by either isogamy and isogamy or oogamy so pheophyces can also reproduce by all the methods of sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction clear moving ahead 
rhodophyce is my dear students rhodophyce is that member is that group of algae where motility is completely absent whether they produced zoospores whether they produce gametes their both gametes male and female will be also non motile and their zoospore will also be a planospore so what we will write that rhodophyces if they are reproducing asexually then they produce non motile spores and if they are reproducing sexually then also they are reproducing by non motile gametes and that type of sexual reproduction in rhodophyces is known as advanced oogamy where both male and female gametes are non motile clear shall we write it so in rhodophyces asexually they reproduce by forming non motile spores and sexually also they reproduce by producing non motile gametes now whether male or female such is known as let me use some other highlighter advanced oogamous type of sexual reproduction clear or not yes very good moving ahead flagellation number of flagella remember this was also one of the feature of classification so moving ahead number of flagella and or if produced so if i talk about the members of chlorophyce then they reproduce they produce motile gametes as well as motile zoospores and the number of flagella may vary from 2 to 6 these flagella are usually apical that means they are placed on the head and they are isoconte isoconte means all the flagella will be of equal length coming to pheophyces pheophyces may the number of flagella reported are only 2 and these two flagella are rather present laterally and the length of both the flagella are different so two lateral flagella and of unequal length so unequal length means heteroconty clear yes and in rhodophyces you know motility is completely absent whether asexually or sexually i hope this whole chart of classification is now clear now let's talk about some examples and end this chart clear very good now if i talk in terms of examples then for chlorophyces you have already learned so many examples again i am going to write the those only which are given in ncert and very very important like chlamydomonas volvox eulothrix spirogyra the filamentous ones etc coming to pheophyces some examples are like fucus laminaria which is an edible which is one of the edible green algae uh, brown algae ectocarpus kelps dictyota so these are some examples of brown algae which you have to remember coming to rhodophyces the examples which you have to remember are gelidium gracilaria these are the two sources of agar agar it is one of the solidifying agent then chondrus and porphyra 
there are many more examples like polysiphonia and all all those you can learn but few examples i have written over here like gelidium gracilaria chondrosand por phyra so this is how the chart of classification ends if you do this chart and read ncrt once your whole algae will be on your tips very good moving ahead with economic importance so economic importance means that where you can use algae economically for human benefit then first and foremost economic importance of algae is that since they are autotrophic they produces they they perform photosynthesis hence helps in purification of air they will perform oxygenic photosynthesis they will take in co2 and release o2 thus they will help in purification of air so first and foremost importance is that they perform photosynthesis hence helps in purification of foul air yes or no correct second some algae are edible like laminaria porphyra so some algae are edible also correct now moving ahead with the third importance of algae which which i will take from red algae red algae like gelidium and gracilaria they yield a very important solidifying agent called agar agar chondrus yields a very important solidifying agent carrageenan and these solidifying agents are used for making ice creams and jellies clear so third economic importance is that solidifying agent solidifying just a second solidifying agent like agar agar and carrageenan are obtained from red algae carrageenan is obtained from red algae chondrus whereas agar agar my dear students it is obtained from red algae gracilaria and gelidium yes or no clear and what is the role of this solidifying agent they are useful in making jellies ice creams correct now bachcho there is one green alga there is one unicellular green alga chlorella apart from chlorella there is one cyanobacteria spirulina they are very good source of protein they are actually single cell proteins and from them protein tablets are obtained which are given to space travelers so chlorella is a green algae whereas spirulina is a cyanobacteria both are very good source of protein they are actually single cell protein so scp like here i will only mention chlorella i will not mention spirulina but orally i am telling you because spirulina is a cyanobacteria chlorella with which we obtain protein tablets and these protein tablets are then given to space travelers clear yes very good and with this these are the different economic importance which you have to remember and with this your algae portion is over now moving ahead with the second important group of plant kingdom from algae to bryophyta so now we are going to start with bryophyta 
so i hope algae is clear to everyone and if it is clear then let's try to solve the question which is given on the screen the question says which of the following is a colonial algae aapko batana hai you have to tell that which among the following option is a green algae which is colonial in nature options are chlamydomonas wallwax eulothrix spirogyra so you know that chlamydomonas is a unicellular it is it does not exist in colonial form if i talk about eulothrix and spirogyra then these two are also filamentous green alga thus the answer of this question becomes b that is wallwax is a colonial green algae hope you know this we have already discussed this thing moving ahead the next question is motile asexual endogenous spore produced in algae are so question is motile asexual and the asexual spores produced in algae are zoospores yes or no so according to the question answer becomes a if i talk about cunidia and sporangiospores then they are observed in case of fungi and a plano means non motile and the question is about motile spores so all these three options become wrong right i hope this thing is clear in everybody's mind now moving ahead with the next group of plant kingdom that is bryophytes bryophytes my dear students they are also known as amphibians of plant kingdom now why are they known as amphibians of plant kingdom this we shall discuss but before let's start with the general features of bryophyta bryophyta are the next group of plants above algae however their body is still thallus like undifferentiated but better as compared to algae my dear students al bryophytes they usually grow in cool damp and shady areas they need water these groups of plant kingdom are still dependent on water for their sexual reproduction see algae majorly they were aquatic but now organisms the plant groups are trying to move from aquatic habitat to terrestrial habitat hence bryophytes are the first group of plant kingdom to come on land but they have vegetatively they have come on land however they are still dependent on water for their sexual reproduction for the transmission of gametes now they are growing on land but depends on water for sexual needs therefore they only grow in cool damp and shady areas now they need land as well as water that is why they are called as amphibians amphibians are those organisms who need both who can either grow on land as well as water so here amphibians are bryophytes because they need land as well as water for completing their life cycle i hope this point is clear now let's try to read the first point bryophytes includes the various mosses and liverworts these are the two groups of bryophytes under bryophytes you study about liverworts hornworts and mosses now they commonly grow in moist and shady areas they are called as amphibians of the plant kingdom why are they called amphibians because they depend upon water for their sexual reproduction while i will teach you the life cycle of bryophytes there i will show you that how they are dependent on water for sexual reproduction but for time being you should remember that bryophytes they depend upon water therefore they are called as amphibians and that is why they grow in cool damp and shady areas they don't grow in dry regions clear moving ahead my dear students the next important feature in bryophytes comes that 
they lack vascular tissues if i talk about the size of bryophytes then their size is hardly 1 to 3 cm bryophytes are not tall trees they are 1 to 3 cm growing on substratum like rock now they are so small why why are they not developing into huge trees because bryophytes lack vascular tissues they do not have xylem or phloem for the conduction now because they don't have tubes they therefore they cannot increase their size that means they are atracheophytes atracheophytes means those group of organisms who lacks vascular tissue like xylem and phloem hence their size is limited to 1 to 3 cm clear next moving ahead my dear students in algae you have observed that in algae during sexual reproduction as they produce zygote that zygote undergoes immediate reduction division because of which soon from diploid stage the life cycle switches to haploid phase hence there is no embryo formation but from bryophytes onward zygote will not undergo immediate reduction division rather it will first undergo mitosis to produce a number of diploid cell stage called embryo so bryophytes are the first embryophytes now onwards zygote will first produce embryo and how it happens it happens because zygote no more undergoes meiotic division rather it performs mitosis yes or no are all the points which are written till here is clear yes ma'am very good now moving ahead so let's talk about the life cycle pattern of bryophytes so you know that bryophytes are amphibians you know that they grow in cool damp shady areas they are atracheophytes hence their size is small they are the first embryophytes now coming to their life cycle pattern and then their body organization so if i talk about the life cycle pattern of bryophytes then it is known as haplodiplontic now what is haplodiplontic so in order to explain you haplodiplontic let's go back to the chart which i prepared while explaining the life cycle of algae so let's go back to that once okay coming to this chart itself students we have discussed about algae algae's life cycle pattern is haplontic now as you go up in the series you know that the dominance of gametophyte decreases and dominance of sporophyte increases when we talk about bryophytes my dear student you can see that still gametophyte is dominant yes or no about 80% of the life cycle or 75% of the life cycle is still under haploid phase however sporophyte may not be dominant but it has increased its value as compared to algae sporophyte in bryophytes may not be that dominant but as compared to algae it has slightly increased its position so this type of alternation of generation where gametophyte is dominant and sporophyte is not that much reduced it is reduced but not highly reduced there are some stages of sporophyte as well so this life cycle pattern where gametophyte is slightly dominant over sporophyte not highly dominant 
this life cycle pattern is known as haplodiplontic haploid phase is dominant over diploid phase gametophytes main which is alternating with slightly reduced or dependent sporophyte clear have you understood with this diagram chalo so let's come back okay so life cycle of bryophyte is haplodiplontic means that gametophyte is the dominant phase dominant means what that the main body of bryophytes is still gametophytic is still made up of haploid cells is still thallus like so when i say that gametophyte is dominant i mean to say that the body that the main body is thallus like is made up of haploid cells clear so gametophyte is dominant that alternates with sporophyte which is not that much reduced as it was in algae but still the sporophyte is dependent on gametophyte it is reduced and dependent on gametophyte clear so you can write that still g is dominant over s so such type of life cycle pattern where haploid phase is dominant where main body is thallus like and it alternates with slightly reduced sporophyte the sporophyte which is dependent upon gametophyte then this life cycle pattern is known as haplodiplontic and your bryophytes exhibits haplodiplontic life cycle pattern so i hope this point is clear what is the life cycle pattern now moving ahead i introduced thallus like so let's talk on the body organization of bryophytes now bryophytes the plant body of bryophyte as compared to algae is better i told you algae are primitive group from algae evolved bryophytes so as compared to algae surely the body of bryophyte is well is better is good is more differentiated however it is still thallus like still it is thallus like made up of group of haploid cells that means the body is undifferentiated do not possess true root stems or leaf rather bryophytes have root like stem like and leaf like structures right yes or no so let me write it over here that the body of bryophytes is thallus like that means undifferentiated correct they lack true root stem and leaves however they possess they possess root like structures stem like structures and leaf like structures like means they are made up of group of haploid cells root like structures my dear students is also known as rhizoids so root like structure means rhizoids stem like structure means colloids and leaf like structure means phylloids but here i am only going to write rhizoids which are of our main concern in some bryophytes rhizoids may be unicellular in some they may be multicellular i'll tell you where clear the role of rhizoids is similar to roots that is absorption of water mineral and providing anchorage 
the function of stem like is similar to that of stem that is conduction and leaf like is also performing same function as true leaves that is photosynthesis they are simply not true because they are made up of haploid cells so only due to the presence of haploid cells in them they are not true they are undifferentiated functionally it is same am i clear very good moving ahead they lack true root stems and leaves but they may possess root like leaf like or stem like structures why because their main body is haploid haploid means again i am writing thallus like right now let's talk about this thallus like body itself now let's come to the sexual part of the bryophyte now you know that the body is thallus like undifferentiated root like stem like leaf like structures may be present apart from this this thallus like body this gametophytic body also possesses sex organs the male sex organ is known as antheridium whereas the female sex organ is known as archegonium the ploidy of antheridium and archegonium is also haploid thus male antheridium is going to produce male gametes by mitosis archegonium female sex organ is going to produce female gamete also by mitosis therefore you have to remember in case of gametophytes the gametes are formed by mitosis because the main body is itself haploid the sex organ are haploid therefore from haploid to haploid mitosis takes place let's read it it produces gametes hence this body is gametophyte the thallus like body possess sex organs that are responsible for producing gametes hence this body is known as gametophyte gamete bearing body the sex organs in bryophytes are haploid but multicellular obviously full fleshed sex organs are present right now i will show you also with the help of a diagram so they are multicellular the male sex organs is called as antheridium responsible for producing male gamete called antherozoid and the female sex organ is archegonium and it is responsible for producing female gamete right so now I, as i have introduced the term sex organ now the main body is thallus like suppose this is the thallus like this is the thallus on this thallus will be present both if it is by if it is monoecious thallus then both the sex organs will be born in the same body and if it is dioecious then sex organs will be present in different bodies for example here i am taking a monoecious thallus monoecious thallus right so this is a thallus whose entire body is made up of number of cells and all these cells are haploid correct in this haploid body there are two sex organs present one is the male sex organ and second is the female sex organ let's take out this male sex organ and try to study its structure in detail the male sex organ is known as antheridium thick it is racket shaped it is a stalked structure right it is multicellular stalked in nature see how so this is how the sex organ appears to be there is a stalk and on top of the stalk there is a globus globose spherical shaped structure so this is globose shaped structure overall 
this anthridium which is a which is multicellular in nature appears to be racket shape in this globose part my dear students there are number of anthrozoid mother cells so these are basically anthrozoid mother cell ploidy haploid correct now take out one mother cell now this mother cell will undergo mitosis haploid hai na so it will undergo mitosis only to produce two biflagellate male gametes called anthrozoid yes or no clear my dear students the sex organs are jacketed they are protected by a layer of sterile cells like this so they are protected by a layer of sterile cell and this layer of sterile cell is known as jacket layer so we can say that that the sex organs in bryophytes are multicellular and jacketed is this anthridium clear male gametes as soon as they are produced they are released from the thallus in search of female gamete male gamete formation you have seen now let's try to decode this female sex organ which is again multicellular jacketed and flask shaped it is somewhat like this so the female sex organ is flask shaped having a neck and a swollen base called venter neck is also protected by a layer of jacket and venter is also protected by a layer of jacket correct this neck is having number of neck canal cells some horizontal and some vertical correct so these are the neck canal cells the mouth the opening of the archegonia students it is covered with the help of cover cells so the opening is covered with the help of cover cells right neck is done coming to the venter the base of archegonium is made up of two cells the upper one is known as venter canal cell whereas this lower one is your female gamete it is non motile and comparatively larger in size talking about the male gamete it is motile and comparatively smaller in size so when this male gamete fertilizes with this kind of ma male uh, female gamete then fertilization in bryophytes will be oogamous type why because male gametes are motile and smaller in size whereas female gametes are larger and non motile in nature so fertilization in bryophytes you can write this point fertilization in bryophyte is oogamous type clear yes or no yes so oogamous fertilization moving ahead 
now you have seen male gamete is ready here female gamete is ready now fertilization how will this male gamete which is outside the thallus and female gamete is inside the thallus female gamete is sitting over here and suppose male gamete is outside how will you take this inside it for this two chemicals two things are required one water second chemo attractants the chemical the agents which are going to be attract which are going to attract male gametes towards archegonia so male gametes first of all water is required and second important thing is the chemical which is released itself by the archegonia all these neck canal cells my dear students and venter canal cells they degenerate to produce chemical and that chemical is sucrose plus potassium ion so sucrose plus potassium ions which are released from the degenerated cells of archegonia attract the male gametes plus water is there so in the presence of water plus these chemicals released from archegonia this male gamete is going to swim with the help of the flagella will reach inside the archegonia everything is empty female gamete is waiting male gamete will go inside will fertilize to form zygote so that means the first cell of sporophyte is produced within archegonium right now will this zygote undergo meiosis no the zygote which is produced inside the archegonium will undergo mitosis to produce embryo so now oh, oh wait i think my hand slided on this board and it got rubbed off no issues right so now what will happen these are the male gametes take the male gametes inside this fertilization takes place and then what will be produced what will be produced yes now here inside a big zygote will be produced this zygote will undergo reduction division to form to form what initially there was single cell zygote it will undergo reduction division repeated division to form embryo which is another stage in sporophyte i hope this fertilization this oogamous fertilization in whole bryophyte is cut clear cut moving ahead i have told you life cycle is haplodiplontic why haplodiplontic i hope that is also clear now moving ahead the classification of bryophytes so bryophytes can be broadly classified into three groups as hepaticopsida commonly known as liverworts followed by anthocyropsida commonly known as hornworts and bryopsida commonly known as mosses in ncrt only two classifications are mentioned that is liverworts and mosses so we are going to study only about the two classifications of bryophyte primitive liverworts and advanced mosses shall we start okay so first let's start with liverworts the two common examples in liverworts which we are going to study is rickshia and marchensia apart from these two there is one more example which you need to learn is porella it is a leafy liverwort right now liverworts they are the primitive bryophytes whose body again is thallus like and its body is dorso ventrally oppressed to the substratum with the help of unicellular rhizoids i will write it 
then i will show you with the help of a diagram see so liver words example i hope you will remember now in liver words body is dorso ventrally appressed appressed means attached to the substratum with the help of unicellular rhizoids highlighted remembered i told you in some bryophytes these rhizoids may be unicellular in some they may be multicellular so here in case of liverworts rhizoids are unicellular type so they have uni cellular rhizoids clear now dorso ventral means that liver words will have two distinct faces one first of all their body is thallus like you know that so they will have two distinct faces a dorsal side and a ventral side so body this is thallus like body undifferentiated body and on this undifferentiated body there will be two distinct faces one dorsal and another ventral clear now when you are observing the ventral face of the liver words then you are going to mark these unicellular rhizoids so on the ventral side you will observe the unicellular rhizoids unicellular rhizoids for the attachment of the body to the substratum clear i hope the line what is written is clear now dorso ventrally appressed to the substratum with the help of unicellular rhizoids right now if i talk about rickshia my dear students then rickshia is a monoecious it is a monoecious liver wort that means on the same thallus both the sex organ will be present that is antheridium as well as archegonium right monoecious means when both male and female sex organs found on same thallai correct but if i talk about marchensia then dear students marchensia is a dioecious liver wort why because in marchensia there are two different thallus one having antheridium and another having archegonium so marchensia is dioecious in nature yes or no so marchensia is dioecious whereas rickshia is monoecious if marchensia is dioecious that means it will have how many thallae two thallae correct one for male sex organ and another for female sex organ one more thing beta in case of marchensia the sex organs are di not directly attached to the substratum but rather they are attached with the help of a stalk now the one having antheridium the one the stalk bearing antheridium is known as antheridiophore correct and the another thallus which is bearing archegonium so this is archegonium so the thallus bearing archegonium the stalk bearing archegonium 
is known as archegoniophore so the stalk is known as archegoniophore clear so monoecious is rickshia whereas marcantia is dioecious there are two different thalli having one on having one anthridium and another having archegonium the one having anthridium sex organs are not directly attached on the thallus they are present with the help of the stalk anthridium bearing stalk is anthridiophore and archegonium bearing stalk is known as archegoniophore clear so far very good so this is about liver words one more thing we can add in liver word is their mode of reproduction so there's a normal sexual reproduction which i have told you anthridium archegonium anthridium produces anthrozoids they swim in water and chemicals to reach the archegonium but if we talk about vegetative and asexual mode of reproduction then vegetatively liver words can reproduce either by fragmentation and in marcantia there is one additional method of reproduction asexual or vegetative reproduction that is gamma formation correct so now i am going to tell you about gamma formation here only some space i will find okay so in marcantia my dear students on the thallus there are some gamma cups present what are present some gamma cups are present on these gamma cups if you can see them small small gamma cups i have made on these are attached stalked eight shaped structures called gamma these gammas undergo mitosis and each gamma can produce two new marcantia so what are gammas gammas are basically multicellular green stalked eight shaped so this is this is gamma cup and this is multicellular eight shaped stalked green gamma this is gamma right it undergoes mitosis and one gamma can produce two new marcantia this is observed specifically in marcantia so you have to remember this additional method of reproduction in it i hope liver words is clear in each and everybody's mind whatever i have told you is very very important hope you have understood it so far correct moving ahead now the next and the most important group of bryophyte most advanced rather i will say are mosses which are actually bryopsida the common term is mosses and the main term is bryopsida the one example which we are going to learn in mosses is about funaria here we are going to see the entire life cycle of funaria right but first let's read some of the points of funaria means of mosses and then we will start specifically the life cycle of mosses while taking the example of funaria clear now in mosses again the main body is thallus like one thing my dear students mosses will they be better than liver words yes or no yes why because mosses are the advanced bryophytes and liver words are the primitive bryophytes so as evolution took place from liver words to mosses definitely the body organization would have become better so we can say that in mosses the body organization is better as compared to liver words the main body of mosses will also remain thallus like undifferentiated gametophyte possessing root like stem like and leaf like structure but their gametophytic body their haploid body is existing in two stages 
one called as protonema which is the juvenile phase that leads to then the adult phase which is leafy gametophore correct now the predominant stage in the life cycle of moss is the gametophyte obviously it is a bryophyte in bryophytes the prom the predominant stage is gametophyte thallus like main body will remain thallus like but it will be better than algae gametophyte which consists of two stages this is additional this you did not observe in case of liver words so if i talk about mosses then their main body is gametophytic thallus like their main body is gametophytic thallus like which exist in two stages like in us our main body is sporophytic but there are two stages now initially we are child and then we grow into adulthood so there are two stages in our life cycle also it's just that we are sporophytic but bryophytes they are gametophytic with two stages one juvenile and another adulthood the juvenile phase is known as protonema that leads to adult phase called leafy gametophore now this leafy gametophore will bear both the sex organ male and female to produce male gametes and female gamete correct yes or no so now let's read it so therefore the first stage in the life cycle of mosses is the childhood phase juvenile phase called protonema this protonema beta it is a green creeping filamentous independent structure having chlorophyll that means it can perform photosynthesis so what how will you identify protonema protonema is a juvenile phase in the life cycle of mosses it is slightly green creeping filamentous haploid structure that develops from the spore correct see so this is protonema which develops from the spore spore i'll show you i'll show you the entire life cycle there i will show you the protonema developing from spore it is how will you identify it is a green creeping branched and filamentous stage this will develop into the protonema then develop into adult leafy gametophore and this adult in initially protonema beta does not have sex organs right when we are children then we may have gonads but they are not going to produce gametes similarly they may have the sex organs but their sex organs are not ready to produce gametes so once the protonema will develop into adult phase then their archegonia and enthridium will become ready to produce the gametes so this is the childhood phase of moss and this is the adulthood phase clear now following they are attached to the soil and second of all the adult leafy gametophore is having root like stem like i'll show you diagrammatically and leaf like structures again the root like structures are rhizoids but in case of mosses these rhizoids are multicellular if i draw the diagram of rhizoids then they will be like this they will be multicellular and each cell will be separated with the help of oblique septa the septa the partition is not straight rather it is it is oblique so this is your root like structure that is rhizoid 
विच इज यू कैन सी मल्टी सेल्यूलर इन नेचर एंड ईच सेल इज सेपरेटेड विद द हेल्प ऑफ ऑब्लिक सेप्टा yes or no this is how the root like structure will appear in case of adulthood mosses again they will they will have stem like structure called colloids bearing leaf like structure called phylloids now let's draw the adulthood of funaria or in general mosses so first of all you need a spore suppose this is a spore it is haploid in nature right this spore will develop into moss but initially it will develop into a juvenile phase of the moss which is protonema protonema is the filamentous green creeping stage which grows and develop into adult leafy gametophore which is characterized by having stem like structure root like structure which are unicellular and bearing what oblique septa multicellular and bearing oblique septa the stem like structure my dear student gives rise to two branches right let me just draw it little bit down so that it becomes convenient for me to explain as i am not that tall <laughs> okay so this protonema will develop into adult body that adult body is having stem like structure that give rise to two branches and bear multicellular rhizoids with oblique septa so this is stem like these are root like on two different branches are present the sex organs on one branch is present the male sex organ and on another branch is present the female sex organ so one is having female sex organ another branch is having male sex organ here i am specifically talking about funaria right so on the same body of funaria both the sex organs are present so you can say that funaria are monoecious type of mosses correct now these sex organs are then protected by leaf like structures so they are well protected by leaf like structures right now take out the male sex organ and female sex organ this is your and th this is your uh, female sex organ and this is your male sex organ i need not to tell you the diagram and all everything venter having two cells neck having some horizontal cells and some vertical cells right here also anthrozoid mother cells they are going to release what biflagellate male gametes biflagellate male gametes is released from the body it comes in the water but what it needs it needs the chemical so that it can reach inside the archegonium for fertilization so the ncc and vcc of archegonium are going to degenerate to release chemicals what are the chemicals sucrose and potassium ion in the presence of the chemical and water this male gamete is going to reach to the archegonium present on the main body and internal oogamous type of fertilization takes place correct zygote is produced now soon after fertilization what will happen main body gametophytic body remains as such there is stem like root like everything remains the same but one thing has got changed that is on the female sex organ zygote has been formed right so zygote which is the first cell of the sporophyte is present on the gametophytic body within the archegonium now this zygote will remain in the archegonium and will undergo 
mitosis to produce embryo embryo is also present within the archegonium attached on the main gametophytic body remember this thing now this embryo will differentiate further it will undergo more mitosis to produce a complete sporophytic body having three parts foot seta capsule it will develop into sporophyte having three distinct parts foot seta and capsule how will it appear to be now it will the main body will remain as it is stem like structure leaf like structure branches here it was archegonium correct now from archegonium will develop a sporophyte so this is the sporophyte right and this is the gametophyte can you see one thing that sporophyte is growing on gametophyte can we say that sporophyte is dependent on gametophyte yes so in case of mosses in case of bryophyta the main body is gametophytic which alternates with dependent sporophyte that is why life cycle is haplodiplontic clear now this is the capsule this region is capsule this is foot capsule and the lower part is seta in capsule meiosis takes place to release spores because this is diploid body so inside the capsule there are diploid cells which undergoes meiosis to produce spores and then those spores are released out right and all the spores which are produced are of same size so jitne bhi spores banenge n number of spores are produced and all spores are of same size this is known as homosporous nature this is how the life cycle of funaria is in under mosses main phase is haploid alternating phase is diploid sporophyte diploid phase is dependent on haploid gametophytic phase therefore life cycle pattern is haplodiplontic i hope this portion is clear to each and every student so with this mosses that is classification of bryophyte is also over so now we are going to start with the next group of plant kingdom which is pteridophytes we have already completed with algae bryophytes now we are moving ahead in the sequence of evolution and we are going to start the next higher group of plant kingdom after bryophytes that is pteridophytes i hope to everybody till bryophytes is clear try to solve questions as much as possible sheets will be practice sheets will be provided to you use those sheets for the practice now moving ahead with the pteridophytes dear students pteridophytes are the first proper plant group which have started growing on land and developed vascular tissues you have observed in bryophytes that in bryophytes also they were start they started growing on land they were terrestrial but they were small in size as they were lacking vascular tissues they were not having xylem and phloem for conduction because of which their size was restricted so we were calling bryophytes as a tracheophyte however if we talk about pteridophytes so pteridophytes are those or the first group of plant kingdom which start developing vascular tissues hence we can say that pteridophytes are the first vascular cryptogams can we say this yes we can say that pteridophytes are the first vascular cryptogams correct so the first vascular cryptogams as they start developing 
conducting tissues like xylem and phloem right moving ahead because they have started developing conducting tissues xylem and phloem so they are no more small in size their size has grown big enough to produce medium sized trees so in group pteridophytes you will see many small sized trees as well which was lacking in bryophytes moving ahead pteridophytes they mainly include horse tails and ferns horse tail is a common name for equisetum and ferns is a common name for dryopteris apart from this we will do the classification of pteridophytes as well so first point says pteridophytes includes horse tails and ferns moving ahead now pteridophytes if i talk about their economic importance so pteridophytes are economically important some pteridophytes they have medicinal uses and some can also be grown as ornamentals like in your homes in your drawing rooms you can use these pteridophytes as decor items you must have seen in some lavish homes where in their drawing rooms they keep their ferns correct as a uh, object of uh, ornamentization so these pteridophytes they are grown as ornamentals and some of them also have medicinal importance apart from them these pteridophytes they have proper root system hence they can also act as soil binders pteridophytes avoid soil erosion clear so the pteridophytes are used as medicinal purpose as well as they are grown as soil binders they are also grown as ornamentals now if i talk about the body organization students so in body organization so far you have seen in bryophytes that the main body was gametophytic yes or no you remember it or not students are you all revising it very good so whatever i am telling please keep all those thing in mind go through the video go through the lecture again and again for proper revision and then read your ncert to make yourself more comfortable will you all do that yes so i was telling you about bryophytes that bryophytes the main body in bryophytes was gametophytic you remember in funaria in liverworts i told you because of which we were saying that their body is thallus like undifferentiated they do not possess true root stems or leaves however pteridophytes onward evolution has happened now the members of pteridophytes the main body is no more gametophytic rather now as you go high in the series you remember the chart that the dominance of pteridophytes uh, the dominance of gametophyte decreases and dominance of sporophyte increases now pteridophytes are middle group of plant kingdom where sporophyte dominance has slightly increased as compared to pteridophytes therefore the main body of pteridophytes will become sporophytic sporophytic means now the body will be made up of group of diploid cells hence you can say that pteridophytes onwards body will become true they will have true roots true stems and true leaves clear very good moving ahead so evolutionary they are the first terrestrial plants to possess vascular tissues i told you they are the vascular cryptogams correct second of all the main body of pteridophytes is sporophytic which is differentiated into true root stems and leaves however their gametophytic phase is also not that much reduced it is also prominent but the main phase has become sporophyte so now sporophyte is the dominant phase that alternates with gametophyte during sexual reproduction 
hence the life cycle of pteridophytes can also be known as haplodiplontic so life cycle of pteridophytes can also be known as haplodiplontic clear why haplodiplontic because here both the phases of life are dominant gametophyte as well as exist as well as sporophyte exist what is the difference as compared to bryophytes in pteridophytes the dominant phase has changed from gameto to sporo now since the main phase is sporophytic since the main body is sporophytic so it is true it possesses true root stems and leaves yes or no clear to everybody very good moving ahead now my dear students similar to that of bryophytes pteridophytes also grow near cool damp and shady areas these pteridophytes are also dependent upon water for their sexual reproduction similar to that of bryophytes so pteridophytes will also prefer to grow in cool damp and shady regions as their male gametes will also look for water during fertilization yes or no so will you remember that bryophytes as well as pteridophytes both require cool damp and shady areas to grow why because they need water for their sexual reproduction will you remember these two points very good now will you tell me that what is the life cycle pattern of pteridophytes haplodiplontic very good is it different from bryophytes yes it is slightly different what is that difference the difference is in case of bryophytes the main phase was gametophyte that alternates with reduced sporophyte whereas in case of pteridophytes the main phase is sporophyte that alternates with slightly reduced gametophyte hope you remember all these points very good now moving ahead now if i talk about i have told you the body of pteridophytes is sporophytic possesses true root stems and leaves very good now my dear students we are going to study the vegetative body of different dryopteris clear there are two example there are two examples of pteridophytes which we have to study one is dryopteris and second is selaginella right so first i am going to tell you about the vegetative body of dryopteris followed by the sexual life cycle of dryopteris and same we will do for selaginella as well so first we are going to start with dryopteris all these points what you can see right now over here we will discuss so but first start with dryopteris dryopteris is one of the type of pteridophytes which is homosporous in nature so first point that you have to remember is that pteridophytes are homosporous in nature homosporous means all spores after meiosis will be of same size all meiospores are of same size first thing right now let's talk about the vegetative body of this dryopteris so if i talk about the vegetative body so vegetative body will be sporophytic or gametophytic yes come on yes it will be sporophytic that means will it have true root stems or leaves yes it will have true root stems and leaves so now vegetative of body of dryopteris possesses true roots 
true stem and true leaves so this is how we can draw a simple dioptrus this is the soil correct now one thing dioptrus possesses big sized leaves called macrophylls so these are the big sized leaf of dioptrus which are called as fronds macro means big phyllus word we use for leaves so fronds are basically macrophylls number 1 point ploidy 2 so these leaves are true in nature when we come to stem in case of dioptrus they have two types of stem underground stem and above ground stem the underground stem is known as rhizome it is also stem true stem why because ploidy ploidy is 2n and this which you can see so this is the above ground stem which is called as stipe ploidy again 2n i am writing ploidy everywhere because on ploidy basis number of questions are asked and if you remember ploidies then surely you are going to secure some marks in your neat examination ploidy based questions are favorite of neat if you really want to score those questions then please remember this thing go through the video again and again just to ensure that you are thorough with the ploidy concept okay so stipe leaves and roots now where are the roots roots in case of rhizome are adventitious in nature adventitious roots my dear students are those which arises from any part of the plant body other than radical so here the roots are arising from the base of the stem ploidy is 2n true roots but they are adventitious in nature so this is how the vegetative body of dryopteris looks like clear now let's switch from vegetative body to its sexual body that how will this dryopteris perform alternation of generation how will this dryopteris live its cycle okay now my dear students in case of dryopteris there are two types of leaves some normal leaves which are only responsible for performing photosynthesis they are macrophylls but there are some other leaves also which apart from performing photosynthesis will also take part in reproduction and these leaves possess some black dots on their lower surface on the abaxial surface of the leaves they have some dot like structures called as sporangia not all leaves will have sporangia but there will be some leaves which on the lower surface will have these black dots these black dots are known as sporangia and the leaves bearing sporangia are called as sporophylls spore bearing leaf are reproductive leaves clear so sporophyll sporangia bearing frond is actually sporomacrophyll yes or no macrophyll normal this is also macrophyll this is also macrophyll but the leaf which is bearing sporangia the leaf which is bearing sporangia is known as sporomacrophyll right vegetative what do you understood two types of leaf you understood simple leaf and sporophylls leaves sporophyll leaf now no, let me take out one sporophyll leaf so this is 
वन स्पोर ऑफ विल लीव दैट इज बेरिंग वॉट स्पोरजिया टेक आउट वन स्पोरजिया साइंटिस्ट वॉट दे विल डू दे विल कट अ थिन सेक्शन ऑफ द स्पोर ऑफ विल will stain this section and will view it under the microscope see what they will observe so take out this one sporangia sporangia bears number of spore mother cells sporangia inside bears number of spore mother cell what will be the ploidy 2n any confusion no ma'am very good so these spore mother cells each spore mother cell will undergo meiosis to produce large number of haploid spores and once the spores will be produced then they will be discharged out all those spores will be of same size so from the from the sporangia there are spore mother cells that have undergone meiosis to produce spores once large number of spores are produced sporangia burst to release all those haploid spores are these spores similar in size yes all are all spores are same in size correct now when these spores will get now they are dispersed now when these spores will get the favorable condition proper nutrient oxygen water temperature light etc when all the conditions will be favorable according to the spores then my dear students these spores will germinate to develop a heart shaped structure a heart shaped structure called prothallus this prothallus is haploid in nature first of all second it is the gametophytic phase in the life cycle of dryopteris this is the sporophytic phase after meiosis haploid independent structure is produced heart shaped structure is produced called prothallus right this prothallus bears rhizoids unicellular rhizoids for the absorption of water and mineral it is green in nature green means it can perform photosynthesis that means prothallus is independent can you tell me why are we calling this prothallus as independent unit we are calling it as an independent because it is green and possesses its own rhizoids hence it can not only absorb water and mineral but can also use it for photosynthesis clear so it can prepare its own food thus the prothallus the gametophytic phase in dryopteris is independent right how it has developed it has developed by the germination of the spores correct now this prothallus is monoecious monoecious means here both the sex organs that is archegonium that is your female gametophyte and anthridium that is male gametophyte will be produced up within the same thallus so this prothallus is monoecious it will have both flask shaped archegonium and racket shaped racket shaped what and tridium correct archegonium is responsible for producing female gamete and anthridium is responsible for producing multiciliate male gametes so now motile gametes are released these are anthrozoids so within anthridium within prothallus 
this anthridium is going to produce motile anthrozoid as soon as it is produced it will be discharged why discharged so that it can reach to the female gamete for fertilization clear and for fertilization it will need what it will need water plus the chemoattractants and the chemoattractants are released by the archegonia itself same as bryophytes you remember in bryophytes also water was required for the motile anthrozoid to reach to the archegonium similarly here also these motile anthrozoids which are released from the anthridium are out from the main body now they will swim in water along in the presence of chemoattractants produced by archegonia and now these anthridium will go and fertilize some other prothallus archegonium clear once again i am repeating this is the prothallus same where there may be one more prothallus so many prothallus must be growing here and there so the male gamete which is released from one prothallus will go to the female gamete of some another prothallus growing near to it showing cross fertilization correct so it shows it prefers cross fertilization that means male gamete from one prothallus will try to fertilize the female gamete of another prothallus once fertilization is done this is going to release the chemicals so in the presence of chemicals and water in the presence of chemicals and water this male gamete from one prothallus will fertilize the female gamete of another prothallus to produce what to produce zygote right and zygote will then develop zygote is present within the archegonium now this zygote will develop into embryo and finally the embryo will develop into a new young sporophyte once the new young sporophyte is produced now it detaches from the prothallus clear yes or no this is how the life cycle pattern of dryopteris is repeating it once again pay attention so initially okay let okay yes so initially you have seen the gametophytic so the sporophytic body the main body of dryopteris on your screen the main body of dryopteris is made up of three parts true roots true stems and true leaves can you see this yes or no okay now true stem two types above ground underground true roots adventitious true leaves fronds large sized fronds now fronds can be of two types simple fronds and some specialized fronds which are bearing sporangia those sporangia bearing fronds are known as macrophyll sporo macrophyll so one sporo macrophyll i have removed from here having sporangia cut a section place it under microscope sporangia will have come on quick sporangia will have smc spore mother cell which undergoes meiosis to produce same size spores yes or no getting my point everybody very good all spores same size hence dryopteris are homosporous what it will happen now now who is going to complete it homospores each spore has capable of developing into a gametophytic body of dryopteris called prothallus yes or no shall i wait or shall i continue continue yes so this is prothallus it 
is a monoecious gametophyte independent gametophyte bears both archegonium and anthridium anthridium releases motile anthrozoites outside the body now in the presence of water and chemicals this anthrozoid is going to fertilize the archegonium of some other prothallus cross fertilization not self cross fertilization once fertilization is done then within the archegonium zygote is produced zygote converts into embryo and then that embryo develops into a new vegetative dryopteris into a new sporophyte initially the young sporophyte is attached to the prothallus but soon it detaches and establish itself as an independent body yes or no so can you see from here till here it is all haploid spores prothallus till fertilization haploid otherwise zygote embryo main body spore mother cell till here it is diploid and this is how alternation of generation takes place in case of pteridophyte dryopteris homosporous pteridophytes clear to everybody see it for next 10 seconds and ensure that you have understood this concept well now read it from ncrt get all your confusions over and practice from the sheet given as well as the extra questions which you can find correct shall we move ahead so this is one of the example of pteridophytes which is homosporous however some pteridophytes are also heterosporous tick like in bryophytes you have seen all homosporous but in pteridophytes some example some species in pteridophytes are homosporous and some are heterosporous homosporous pteridophyte life cycle you have seen now we are going to see the life cycle pattern of a pteridophyte which is heterosporous in nature correct and that example is selaginella so selaginella my dear students is a heterosporous pteridophyte that means once meiosis will take place it is going to produce two sizes two different sizes of spore one big sized spore and one small sized spores the bigger size spores are known as megaspore whereas the small sized spore is known as microspore right very good let's move ahead so first as we did for dryopteris we first understood the vegetative body similarly we are going to do for selaginella also in selaginella first i'm going to show you its vegetative body and then we will study about its reproductive life cycle so let's start get ready get set ready yes so keep yourself motivated keep studying keep yourself focused focus is very very important no need to lose your focus coming to selaginella selaginella beta first of all it is also a pteridophyte so the main body of selaginella will also be sporophytic it will also have true roots stems and leaf correct now selaginella main stem is parallel to the soil it is horizontal to the soil and shows dicotomous branching that is the main stem divides into two like you have seen in the snake's tongue na snake tongue it bifurcates into two so that is called as dicotomous branching here also in case of selaginella the stem shows
dichotomous branching correct now moving ahead these dichotomous branching of stem bears small sized leaves and the small sized leaves are microphylls these are what small sized leaves which are called as microphylls macro means big sized small sized like microphylls correct they also bear roots the roots are again adventitious type why the roots are adventitious because they are not arising from the radical rather they are arising from any other part of plant body this is how the body of selaginella looks like correct one feature i would like to tell you about selaginella my dear students selaginella can even grow in extreme extreme dry conditions when there is completely drought conditions there is no water at all in that condition also these selaginella can survive how they turn their body woolly right now it's completely spread whole green like structure now but if the condition becomes extremely dry then these selaginella they roll themselves they become a mass of woolly object and it seems as if they have died but now that woolly body you again immerse in water it will spread into a new green body so it appears as if selaginella has died but no selaginella it is its adaptation to overcome the extreme dry environmental conditions that is why this selaginella is also known as resurrection plant resurrection means to come back to life like in bible uh, jesus christ was considered to have shown resurrection he died and then he reappeared so similar is for selaginella selaginella is also considered as a resurrection plant why because when it turns woolly when it becomes completely brown it seems as if it has died but then again you immerse in water for some time it becomes green and becomes again fleshy it seems as if it has come to life clear very good so now this is how the vegetative body of selaginella appears to be bearing some microphylls now same as that of dryopteris these microphylls there are some specialized microphylls which will bear sporangia correct so there will be some microphylls that will bear sporangia those sporangia bearing leaves will be called as sporophylls clear however in case of selaginella which is a heterosporous species there will be two types of sporophylls there will be two types of sporophyll one bearing small sized sporangia called microsporangia so one bearing small sized sporangia and another bearing big sized sporangia the small sized sporangia bearing sporophyll is known as microsporophyll whereas the big sized sporangia bearing sporophyll is known as mega sporophyll clear now microsporophyll is bearing what small sized sporangia take out it megasporangia 
bearing megasporophyll take out one megasporangia be it megasporangia or microsporangia they will have what they will have microspore mother cell so these are microspore in case of microsporophyll and megaspore in case of megasporophyll so they bear microspore mother cell here they bear megaspore mother cell right now microspore mother cell will undergo meiosis to produce microspores correct and here megaspore mother cell will undergo meiosis to produce to produce what to produce megaspore yes or no now my dear students the difference can you see in case of dryopteris there was only one type of spore no mega no micro right but in case of selaginella you can see there are two different type of sporophylls producing two different sized spores some big sized spores called megaspore and some small sized spores called microspores right now this is one difference second difference in dryopteris as soon as the spores were produced they were discharged out tick they were released and whatever development has to take place will take place independent of the sporophytic body but here in case of selaginella there is slight difference the spores as soon as they are produced they are not discharged they are temporarily retained on the parent body the spores as soon as they are produced suppose these are microspores and these are megaspores so as soon as they are produced they are still on the body they are not discharged and what happens then if they are present in the same body microspore and megaspore they undergo development within the parent body this microspore develop into male gametophyte that is your anthridium within the parent body initially in dryopteris development was independent of parent body however in selaginella which is a which is a heterosporous species development of male gametophyte that is anthridium is taking place within the parent body megaspore develop into archegonia where within the parent body it is not discharged it is retained but this retainment is temporary now anthridium when it comes to specific stage right then this anthridium is discharged once it comes to a specific stage on the parent body after that male gametophyte is then discharged then same process then from anthridium anthrozoids will be released in search of water and the chemicals which are released by the archegonia that is still present on the parent body that means whatever fertilization now anthridium is going to produce what now anthridium is going to produce the anthrozoids right these anthrozoids with the help of water they will reach to the archegonia that is still attached to the parent body that means fertilization in case of selaginella 
takes place within the parent body when within the archegonium when it's still attached to the parent body now after fertilization after zygote formation and embryo development now this archegonium detaches from the body parent body and grows independently into a new sporophyte correct so this is what the difference is between selaginal life cycle and dryopterous what is the difference the major difference is that selaginella is a heterosporous species whereas dryopterous is a homosporous species number 1 number 2 dryopterous being homosporous produces monoecious gametophyte called prothallus spores as soon as they are produced they are discharged they are not retained on the parent body they are soon discharged correct but in case of selaginella there are first of all two different sized spores produced megaspore and microspore as soon as they are produced they are not discharged they are retained temporarily once anthridium is developed from the microscope spore then is then it is discharged out and archegonium remain attached on the parent body now anthrozoid will go to the archegonium will fertilize the egg will form the zygote when archegonium is still present on the parent body after this this female gametophyte will dis, uh, will get detached from the parent body and now it will establish itself as an independent body ab iska yahan se hoga detachment and now it will establish as an independent body to produce a new sporophyte clear very good now one more very very important information this heterospore which was observed in selaginella my dear student is called as the precursor to seed habit what we say we say one thing that selaginella selaginella shows heterospore which is the precursor to seed habit now what is this seed is what beta seed is actually formation of covering around the embryo right there is a zygote that zygote undergoes mitosis to produce a multicelled embryo to protect this embryo there should be a covering and that covering is actually known as seed right formation of zygote is due to fertilization once fertilization took place zygote is ready it will develop into embryo but formation of this covering formation of the seed around the embryo is the duty of parent body right it is the duty of parent body and parent will be able to perform this duty only when this embryo remains on it like simple example we have our parents our parents duty is to protect us correct but they will only be able to protect you if you are living with them in their home suppose you leave their home at a very early age you fight with your parent you leave their home and you go somewhere without informing your parents so will your parents be able to protect you now when you have left their home even if you are young no because they don't know you did not stay along with them they don't know where are you so how will they protect you how will they give a special covering to you right so same case happens with bryophytes and pteridophytes what happens as soon as fertilization takes place what happened in selaginella 
fertilization took place zygote formed embryo slightly developed as soon as that embryo was developing the baby the archegonium left the parent house and the parent sporophyte did not get an opportunity to create a covering around that embryo so seed was not produced in pteridophytes in heterosporous species clear but these selaginella this heterosporic concept gives a hint to higher plant kingdom that is gymnosperms that if you want to protect your baby if you want a seed then don't let archegonia fall off hold that archegonia hold your child tightly so that even after fertilization it does not fall off embryo formation will take place on the parent body archegonium is still attached so now parent will get an opportunity to form a covering clear so heterospory which is observed in selaginella is a precursor means formula to seed habit why because like this male body male gametophyte female gametophyte will be different female gametophyte archegonia remains on the parent body hold it for long and let the covering comes around the embryo now when selaginella knew the formula then why it itself could not form seed because the baby was not good like you as soon as fertilization took place in the archegonium that child left the parent home and did not let covering come over so heterospory is the precursor to seed habit observed in case of selaginella but they themselves could not form seed as the retainment of female gametophyte was temporary clear to everybody so selaginella heterospory precursor they could not form seed could not produce seed why as the retainment of female gametophyte was temporary got it everybody okay very good so with this selaginella life cycle is also done i hope both the life cycle one homosporous example we took of dryopteris and second example we took of heterosporous pteridophyte selaginella so this is how their life cycle is and the life cycle is haplodiplontic type where main body is sporophyte it alternates with slightly reduced gametophyte correct now moving ahead towards the next is classification so classification nothing you have to do you just have to remember the names and their examples classification pteridophytes can be classified into four groups you already know xylopsida lycopsida sphenopsida and pteridopsida so one example of xylopsida remember xylotum lycopsida includes selaginella which i told you and lycopodium sphenopsida includes equisetum and pteridopsida includes organisms like dryopteris teris and ediantum so will you remember all these example if yes then with this pteridophytes is over and now we are going to switch to next group that is gymnosperms but before switching to gymnosperms let's see how much you have learnt in pteridophytes so i have some questions for you let's see how much you recall first question says pteridophytes are options only homosporous both homo and hetero only hetero none of the above right now only i taught you pteridophytes some species can be homosporous some can be heterosporous like dryopteris and selaginella respectively hence the answer of this question becomes b yes or no i hope there is no confusion in anybody's mind cool 
so with this your pterodophyte group is also over cryptogams are finally over and we are switching to phanerogams the first group in phanerogams are gymnosperms so now we are going to start with as i said phanerogams and the first group of phanerogams the first group of spermatophytes is gymnosperms the term gymnosperms if i talk about gymno term itself means seed bearers so these are those group of plant kingdom which start producing seeds however their seeds are naked their seeds are how their seeds are naked gymno means naked and sperma word we use for seeds so gymnosperms are spermatophytes they are better than pteridophytes because they start producing seeds however their seeds are naked now what do you mean when i say naked seeds naked means that seeds are there but around the seeds there are no covering like fruit wall or ovary wall like for example imagine a mango which is only having the seed no fruit no pulpy juicy mango so this is how the seeds in case of gymnosperms are produced only seed no covering no fruit around it and this and what is the reason behind it the reason is that gymnosperms only possess ovule they do not have ovary wall that also fertilizes to form fruit so gymnosperms they are those group of plant kingdom which produces seeds however their seeds are naked as the ovules are not enclosed by ovary wall ovules are there so seed is produced but no ovary wall so fruit is missing hence the ovules are exposed they are not covered by ovary wall thus the seeds are also exposed and they are not protected by any fruit or ovary wall i hope the first point is clear second point my dear students we have moved quite ahead in plant kingdom you are done with algae bryo teredo now in evolution series if i talk about then gymnosperms are one of the advanced group of plant kingdom and you remember as we go high in the series the dominance of sporophyte keeps on increasing and dominance of gametophyte keeps on reducing just for a hint this is how the chart was yes or no algae bryo teredo gymno and angio so this was how the chart goes on on the y axis on the y axis you have gametophyte whereas on the x axis you have sporophyte so can you see in case of gymnosperms talking about gymnosperms the gametophyte has become highly reduced so small but when we come to sporophyte can you see the major phase of the life cycle in gymnosperms as well as in angiosperm is sporophyte and gametophyte has become highly highly reduced so now the life cycle pattern in gymnosperms as well as angiosperms will switch from haplodiplontic to diplontic life cycle pattern now in gymnosperms the life cycle pattern becomes diplontic why diplontic main body is sporophytic that you also saw in pteridophytes but in dry or in gymnosperms the main body is sporophytic which alternates with highly reduced gametophyte sporophyte has become highly dominant and gametophyte has become highly reduced like you can see in this chart hence the life cycle pattern in last two groups of plant kingdom becomes diplontic in algae you have seen the life cycle pattern as 
haplontic in bryo and teredo you have seen the life cycle pattern as haplodiplontic now as you go high in the series the life cycle pattern changes to diplontic where sporophyte phase is highly dominant and it alternates with highly reduced gametophyte i hope the second point is also clear very good moving ahead to the third and important segment seeds that are developed post fertilization they are naked you know why are they naked because not covered by an ovary wall right moving ahead now if i talk about the sizes in gymnosperm if i talk about the tree organ if different types of plants observed in gymnosperms then gymnosperms may have some herbs shrubs and even tall sized trees are also seen as you go in hilly areas na when you go towards hilly areas my dear students there on the sides of the road you see some conical shaped trees so big so huge trees are those conical shaped what are those those are actually type of gymnosperms so there are some trees in case of gymnosperms which can be very tall some medium sized and some small sized one of the tallest gymnosperm is redwood tree which is scientifically called as sequoia so sequoia name you have to remember it is one of the tallest gymnosperm which is commonly called as redwood tree and the scientific name you have to learn as sequoia clear yes or no okay very good moving ahead so now gymnosperms life cycle you know next important feature is that they all are heterosporous the primitive gymnosperms or advanced gymnosperms they all are heterosporous means they all types of gymnosperms after meiosis will produce two types of spores big sized megaspore and small sized microspore can you see the evolution sequence getting my point bryophytes all homosporous pteridophytes some homo some hetero gymnosperms and angiosperms all heterosporous this is how evolution sequence is going on bryophytes life cycle haplodiplontic pteridophytes haplodiplontic gymno angio diplontic can you see how we are heading upward in evolution sequence slowly and steadily advancement in features is taking place correct initially no seed but now seed formation has started so these are the features which are showing you the series of evolution that how the primitive features got replaced by advanced features homospore changed to heterospore haplontic life cycle changed to diplontic life cycle dependence on water is now over you have seen algae pure aquatic pteridoe and bryophytes terrestrial but still dependent on water for sexual reproduction but gymnosperms onward no more dependence on water these gymnosperms can grow everywhere as they are not strict to water they don't need water for sexual reproduction next important point now no more dependence on water for sexual reproduction clear okay now let's talk about some examples of gymnosperms so that we can use them in order to study the life cycle pattern of gymnosperms right so before starting with the life cycles of different gymnosperms first check out their classification which is very very simple as you have seen in case of pteridophytes also 
classification gymnosperms can be divided into four as jinko gales the most primitive gymnosperms are jinko gales the example the only living fossil of jinko gale present now is jinko biloba it is a living fossil with fan shaped leaves so the leaf structures of jinko biloba which is a living fossil is fan shaped moving ahead to cycadales after jinko gales came cycadales the most common example is cycas we are going to study the vegetative body of cycas now next came coniferales the best example of coniferales is pinus there in your syllabus in detail and the most advanced gymnosperms are knee tails three examples you have to learn that is neatum ephedra and velvicia will you remember it yes ma'am very good these three the members of knee tails they slightly show connection with angiosperms correct they start showing connection with angiosperms because they are the advanced gymnosperms and slightly heading towards angiosperms okay so this is our classification is now before starting with the vegetative body of cycas and pinus let me tell you one more thing gymnosperms are after pteridophytes pteridophytes themselves started producing vascular tissues so in gymnosperms also there are well developed vascular tissues like xylem and phloem xylem mainly comprises of tracheids and gymnosperms uh, and uh, phloem mainly comprised of company albuminous cells and sieve cells correct so they also have gymnosperms also have well developed xylem and phloem they are the vascular phanerogams you can say so xylem and phloem are present that is vascular tissues xylem is mainly characterized by the presence of tracheids vessels are still absent development of vessel is observed in angiosperms whereas phloem is characterized by the presence of seep cells and albuminous cells correct now moving ahead now you have seen the classification of gymnosperms and the two groups which are mainly we are going to study is cycadales that is cycas and coniferales that is pinus so first i am going to show you the the vegetative body of cycas as well as pinus in a comparative mode so let's see now you have seen the classification of gymnosperms so now let's start the comparative study of two major gymnosperms which are there in your syllabus cycas and pinus right so now let's see the first we are going to see the comparative body organization of both cycas and pinus and then we are going to study their reproductive phases you know that in cycas as well as in pinus the main body is sporophytic having well differentiated true roots stems and leaves correct so first we are going to analyze their main body and then we are going to see their reproductive system so let's first make a chart where we can study the comparative body organization of two broad groups of gymnosperms cycadales and coniferales example we took is of cycas and pinus true root body is there true system is there sporophytic body so first let's start with their root system true roots again means 2n be it cycas or pinus they both have tap root system in cycas also root system is tap root in pinus also root system is tap root tick apart from tap root in case of cycas their roots are also the host for cyanobacteria like anabena anabena lives in the root system of cycas 
helps in nitrogen fixation provides nitrogen to cycas in return they get the shelter as well as food so it is kind of a symbiotic mutualistic association between the roots of cycas and cyanobacteria like anabena so this is one special feature which you have to remember what is that special feature roots are also host for cyanobacteria like anabena so the roots of cycas and anabena my dear students they form a symbiotic association where the roots are getting fixed nitrogen in return roots are giving anabena food and shelter clear if i talk about pinus then pinus roots are very woolly they lack root cap they are not well developed so they are not sufficient enough to absorb water and mineral from the soil hence dear students you remember biological classification mycorrhiza the last topic so here pinus allows the formation of symbiotic association called mycorrhiza so what are you going to write it for what are you going to write it for pinus roots form association with fungi symbiotic association called mycorrhiza where fungi provides roots that means the plant absorbed water and mineral in return roots give fungi shelter and food clear yes or no so this is how the root organization in cycas and pinus is right clear now moving ahead this is how the root system is now let's talk about their shoot system so they also possess true shoots which are also diploid correct diploid shoot in case of cycas my dear stems are unbranched stems are straight you must have seen uh what to say some cycas near your home or in some parks their stem is unbranched all the branches are arising from the top like this right so in case of cycas stem is true and it is unbranched that means all the branches they are not arising from the sides rather the all the branches are arising from the top giving a crown like it it seems there's a body it is wearing a big crown but if i say about pinus then in case of pinus the branch the stem is branched and number of branches are arising in such a manner that it gives a conical shape so here the stem is branched clear giving a conical shape you must have seen so many conical shaped trees when you go towards hilly areas right so this is how true roots and true shoot true shoot is now third important vegetative part is the true leaves so diploid leaf system is present in case of cycas the leaves are compound which type of compound pinnately compound so if question comes to you that what is the leaf arrangement in case of cycas then what will be your answer 
your answer should be cycas bears compound leaves which compound palmate ya pinnate so cycas have pinnately compound leaves coming to pinus dear students pinus leaves are first of all simple there are two types of leaves simple and compound so pinus have simple leaf cycas have compound leaf first thing second thing pinus dear students these plants they are found in hilly areas hilly areas are also xerophytic why water is there but water has just frozen into ice free no normal water is literally very less in hilly areas when you go to hilly areas their water is majorly in the form of ice due to low temperature so we can say that pinus like trees are growing in areas where water is scarce that type of condition is known as xerophytic so pinus is growing actually in xerophytic conditions so if xerophytic conditions is there then these leaves will show xerophytic adaptation and xerophytic adaptation means leaves cannot be broad rather they will be reduced to spines they will have thick cuticle sunken stomata just to avoid loss of water so similar is the case with pinus because pinus is growing in xerophytic conditions therefore leaves are simple but reduced to spines clear apart from this they have they have thick cuticle they have sunken stomata all the adaptations which you know for xerophytes so this is how the body of cycas and pinus the vegetative body of cycas and pinus is clear root shoot and leaf system will you remember it very very important for your neat question will be surely asked plus 4 marks if you really want to gain these 4 marks please do go through this lecture again and again learn this chart remember all the modifications and secure your four marks correct very good now moving ahead towards the reproductive part this is how the vegetative part is now moving ahead towards the reproductive part as you have seen in case of pteridophytes gymnosperms also their leaves not all some leaves are specialized for reproduction those specialized leaves are called as sporophylls now you know that all gymnosperms are heterosporous therefore there will be two types of sporophyll microsporophylls and megasporophylls correct yes or no correlate with pteridophytes come on so now we are going to talk about the reproductive mode so reproductive mode leaves there are some specialized leaves called sporophylls how many types of sporophylls two microsporophyll the leaf which is bearing small sized sporangia called microsporangia right here megasporophyll the leaf bearing megasporangia right now beta in some pteridophytes like selaginella and equisetum and majority of the gymnosperms their leaves they are not open the sporophylls i'm talking about only sporophylls their sporophylls are not open rather they coil inward to form a compact cone like structures in market cones are so many cones available as female cone male cone of pinus 
you must have brought from the market and must be kept in your uh, drawing room as a decorative we usually keep them as decoratives right so what are those cones those cones are actually the sporophylls the compact sporophylls in case of gymnosperms and some pteridophytes like say lagenilla and equisetum the sporophylls they are not open rather they coil inward to form a cone shaped structures microsporophyll will form male cone megasporophyll will form female cone so megasporophyll they coil inward to form female cone and microsporophyll they coil inward to form male cone so this thing you have to remember theek hai male cone and female cone now in case of pinus my dear students both the cones male ho ya female ho both the cones are present on the same body so therefore pinus are monoecious however in case of cycas male cone and megasporophylls are present on two different bodies that is why cycas are dioecious so will you remember this thing cycas are dioecious and pinus are monoecious why in case of pinus both mega and microsporophylls both the cones are present on the same body but in case of cycas there are two different bodies so cycas are dioecious and pinus are monoecious very very important again please do remember moving ahead now female cone we'll talk about later but first come to male cone male cones are having microsporangia take out them same process no difference this is what microsporangia iske andar kya hoga they will have microspore mother cell diploid cells everything is diploid now what will happen in this now inside it meiosis will take place they will produce spores some small sized spores called haploid microspores spores as soon as they are produced they are not discharged they are temporarily retained you remember selaginella heterospory now microspores will develop into male gametophyte called pollen grain so now from gymnosperms onwards the terminology for male gametophyte has changed from anthridium to pollen grain and pollen grain represents highly reduced male gametophyte as soon as it is produced it is discharged from the body and through air current through wind it is then pollinated can you see the difference initially water was used now wind is used for pollination for the transmission of male gametes evolution we are heading upward can you see the correlation how we are changing very good so pollen grains represent highly reduced let me write it very very important highly highly reduced male gametophyte which is produced and discharged through wind current now pollen grain carrying the male gamete is ready ready so one gamete is ready now let's try to ready the female gamete so that only fertilization can take place okay female cone is there megasporangia within the megasporophyll is there now see the diagram suppose this is a megasporophyll i'm just trying to draw a section of megasporophyll on which a megasporangium is attached so this is megasporophyll
and on this this megasporangium is attached this is megasporangium megasporangium is equivalent to ovule now we are using the term ovule why because seed formation will take place so this is the covering that transforms into seed that is why it is called as ovule right this ovule is integumented normal shape of ovule it is having in integuments one integument is there correct there is a opening on the top called micropyle so that pollen grain can come right within integuments there are tissues what are those called as nucellus very good thick from opening pollen grain is going to come from here the pollen grain is going to enter now one of the cell of the nucellus it starts growing in size so one of the cell of the nucellus grows in size this cell is known as megaspore mother cell correct this megaspore mother cell my dear students undergoes meiosis to produce four haploid megaspores out of which three becomes non functional kaam karna band kar dete hain and only one megaspore remains functional right now this functional megaspore haploid will undergo mitosis correct to produce haploid endosperm and the female gametophyte reduced gametophyte still we are using the term archegonia clear yes or no so here archegonium is there now you can replace it and place a archegonium two to four archegoniums stick pollen grain has landed it will now pollen grain will produce pollen tube pollen tube will come carrying the male gametes now with the help of pollen tube here the egg is waiting what will happen this pollen tube will enter inside the archegonium will deliver its male gamete to fertilize with the female gamete and zygote will be produced zygote will then turn into embryo it is still this archegonia within the ovule is not going to discharged even after embryo formation it will remain attached and now parent will get an opportunity to protect its child it will protect the embryo by converting this integument into seed coat that is seed so now like this gymnosperms are the first one to produce seed why because their female gametophyte even after fertilization is not discharged out it remains attached on the parent body thus parent gets an opportunity to convert its megasporangium into seed clear yes or no one more time last two minutes for quick revision reproduction leaves specialized leaves sporophyll megasporophyll microsporophyll microsporophyll male cone megasporophyll female cone male cone carrying microsporangia microsporangia bearing microspore mother cell meiosis microspores microspore develop into pollen grain released dispersed through air current lands on the megasporangia through opening called micropyle inside the micropyle archegonium is waiting how archegonium developed it developed by the mitosis of megaspore correct now through the pollen tube male gametes are discharged within the archegonium 
fertilization takes place zygote zygote then embryo and embryo ovule transforms into seed yes or no so with this your gymnosperms is also done if you remember this much well and good it is very very important very very important from the point of view of neat if you remember the entire lecture which i have told you which i have given you today then i can assure you all your questions related to plant kingdom will get solved but one thing is very important hard work and determination students let me tell you one thing those students will only crack neat who are determined focus and hard workers there is no escape from hard work if you do not give hard work to your studies studies are not give, going to give you anything in return right so respect your studies do hard work get yourself into some good medical colleges and then bring out the good name of your parents okay so with this your gymnosperms is also done last but not the least the highest most group of plant kingdom angiosperms we are not going to do so much in angiosperms because why are we not going to do because in and for class 12th you have two complete chapters on angiosperms the first chapter and the second chapter so everything will be covered over there here only slight introduction is required which is sufficient enough to solve questions of this chapter right angiosperms most evolved group of plant kingdom first point second now ovules megasporangia they are protected by ovary wall no more seeds will be naked because ovules are not naked they are protected by ovary wall seed formation will also take place fruit formation will also take place unlike gymnosperms where ovules were naked but in gymno angiosperms also called as flowering plants what will happen ovules pollen grains and ovules are developed in specialized structures called flowers now till gymnosperms you have seen leaves as reproductive organ right sporophylls but angiosperms may there are some specialized organ produced on the plant body called flowers now leaves are no more concerned with sexual activity for sexual reproduction in angiosperms there are special organs called flowers flowers bear male reproductive organ and female reproductive organ transmission of gametes takes place pollination takes place and then zygote formation also happens ovary wall are present thus ovules are no more naked so ovules are not naked as ovules are protected by ovary wall so seeds be banenge and seeds ke sath fruit formation also take place clear now angiosperms can be divided into two broad groups as dicotyledons and monocotyledons correct moving ahead little bit life cycle of angiosperm i'm going to show you and in this life cycle i am going to cover all the important points which you have to remember for time being correct okay so angiosperms first of all they are flowering plants yes or no tick so now suppose this is a plant bearing leaves stem roots proper and have a beautiful flower now this flower will have both the sex organ maybe both the sex organ or one of them the male sex organ that is called as stamen or androecium which is represented by two parts 
एंथर एंड फिलामेंट वेर एज इट विल ऑल्सो बेयर द फीमेल रिप्रोडक्टिव ऑर्गन कॉल्ड कार्पिल दिस कार्पिल हैज हाउ मेनी पार्ट थ्री पार्ट यू ऑल नो स्टिग्मा स्टाइल एंड ओवरी कैन यू सी ओवरी वॉल हैज कम एंड विद इन दिस ओवरी आर प्रेजेंट ओव्यूल्स करेक्ट नाउ वॉट विल हैपन दीज एंथर आर गोइंग टू प्रोड्यूस द मेल गैमेटो फाइट आफ्टर मी ऑसिस टाइम बिंग दे आर डिप्लॉइड हियर ऑल्सो डिप्लॉइड नाउ विद इन एंथर आफ्टर मी ऑसिस मेल गैमेटो फाइट हाईली रिड्यूस्ड गैमेटो फाइट इज गोइंग टू बी प्रोड्यूस्ड कॉल्ड एज pollen grain correct once pollen grains are produced within the anther they will be discharged out and they may be pollinated either with the help of wind water or insects etc correct now this is the ovule let me take out the ovule within the ovary wall ovule has a specialized female gametophyte no more archegonium now for female gametophyte we use the term embryo sac female gametophyte is now known as embryo sac and the most common arrangement of cells in embryo sac is seven celled eight nucleate as this embryo sac has three antipodals one female gamete protected by two synergids and one large central cell which is diploid in nature so this female gametophyte is haploid pollen grains are also haploid this is where the gamete this is the egg female gamete that is waiting for the pollen grains to bring the male gamete for the fertilization a time will come when this pollen grain is going to land on the stigma correct once it lands this now pollen grain is going to germinate to form the pollen tube see pollen tube will come now yes or no so pollen tube is going to come bringing what bringing the male gametes two male gametes at a time are coming both the male gametes will be given inside the embryo sac now after the two male gametes one of the male gamete is going to fertilize with your egg suppose this is egg blue color egg pink color male gamete to form zygote correct so one zygote will be produced see this is going to fertilize with the egg to form zygote and second male gamete is going to fertilize with the secondary cell to form to form endosperm zygote is diploid but endosperm is triploid together it is known as triple fusion sorry double fertilization so together it is known as double fertilization so double fertilization is actually formation of zygote and endosperm together and it is a characteristic feature of only angiosperms zygote formation took place here so here is your zygote within the ovule within the embryo sac and this is your endosperm zygote 2n endosperm 3n soon after this happens 
the ovule transform into seed and ovary transform into fruit so seeds are no more naked ovules are no more naked now you enjoy the fruit you eat the fruit you throw the seed seed having the embryo inside it whenever gets the favorable condition develops into a new plant so this is how the simple life cycle pattern of angiosperms happen there are two different sex organ male gamete producing female gamete producing male gamete producing is androsium female gamete producing is gynosium male gamete carrying pollen grain female gamete carrying embryo sac pollination takes place formation of pollen tube takes place discharge of both the male gametes double fertilization zygote embryo seed fruit new plant so this is the simple life cycle pattern with this your whole chapter of plant kingdom is over life cycle patterns i have already told you in mid algae haplontic bryo teredo haplodiplontic and this angiosperms and gymnosperms showing diplontic life cycle pattern i hope the entire chapter is clear cut in everybody's mind your job is only to read the notes which i am going to provide as well as the ncrt go through the lecture make sure you share it with your friends also because the one who helps themselves as well as others god is seeing god is going to help you so be a good friend be a good listener enjoy the video do share the video as well now without question solving nothing is complete so let's see few questions as a part of revision number one question is endosperm and gymnosperm is what is the ploidy of endosperm so go back to gymnosperm where it is bhai okay gymnosperm gymnosperm yes tell me where it is written on the screen so endosperm in gymnosperm ploidy is haploid why because it develops by the mitosis of haploid megaspore remember so the answer of that question will become what will become a haploid triploid is the ploidy of endosperm in case of angiosperms but in case of gymnosperms the ploidy is haploid right clear very good moving ahead female gametophyte in angiosperm is known as right now only we did it archegonia no megasporangium no bachche it is the ovule pollen grain no it is actually the male gametophyte so answer will be b embryo sac embryo sac is the female gametophyte in case of angiosperms very good moving ahead third question strobilus strobilus is actually my dear students other name for cones the male cone and the female cone correct so strobilus is found in equisetum ediantum marshallia or rhinia so i told you there are only two pteridophytes that form strobilus that forms cone equisetum and selaginella hence answer of this question will become a yes or no i hope the whole lecture is going to be useful to you and if you have watched till end so thank you for watching see you in the next lecture till then keep working hard keep yourself motivated take care bye bye good night take care